and broadband rollout. I signed on to Congresswoman Matsui's bill because I want to discuss the next steps for, utili uh, for utilizing the fund to support broadband access. Unfortunately, the bill before us does not address the low-income lifetime program that would support universal broadband deployment under uh, Ms. Matsui's bill. So I'm interested in alternative method, um, methods that you would have for addressing this issue. It also does not discuss the schools and libraries program. That leaves a lot out of the equation. Schools and libraries are our anchor institutions and I have voiced my concern for funding their broadband access. And the last mile of broadband needs to go to urban as well as rural areas quickly, both in, times of time, both in terms of time and speed. So I look forward to working on, a, uh, uh, on the bill, Mr. Chairman, uh, with you and Mr. Terry on developing this important piece of legislation uh, that I believe needs to be compre uh, comprehensive and holistic in its approach. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo. The ranking Republican member of our full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses. I think we need a few more, Mr. Chairman. I don't think you've <laughs> quite covered the total spectrum. My next door neighbor wasn't invited, and we need to <laughs> get them out here. Um, I'm going to submit my opening statement for the record. Um, put it in, in terms that average people understand. I like the bill if, if I'm ready to take you to the prom, but I'm not ready to marry you. You know? There's still work that needs to be done. Some cosmetic touch-ups, you know, a little better attitude maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're on the right track, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's obvious that the fund is broken. I mean, you know, more people have cell phones than have hardline phones. Um, the United States is the most wired country in the world. Those of us that have uh, all the idiocentric laws that we've got to deal with have two Blackberries, three cell phones, plus all the hardline phones. Um, my condo here in Washington, in Virginia, I, I, I basically just have a phone there to have a phone in case there's some emergency or something. Uh, my USF fee uh, is probably 20 to 30 percent of my bill because I pay the absolute minimum each month. I, I just think that's not appropriate. Your, you and Mr. Terry's bill which you have worked with me on, uh, and Mr. Terry has worked with me on, I, I really, really want to support. But it does concern me that under this bill, the size of the fund could actually increase and not decrease. Uh, I think we need a firm cap. Obviously, that's something that we need to work on or discuss. There's some things that we could do that are not in the bill uh, to, to make it more competitive in the service fund, I think it's ridiculous that some areas have 30 different phone companies that get subsidies. I just, I don't, I don't buy that. I can, I can buy two maybe or three for competitive purposes, but 30, uh, I just think that's wrong. And while you and I have discussed this at some length, um, having a mandate, um, is a difficult concept for somebody like me to swallow for broadband. I'm not saying it's may not be appropriate, but it, it, it is something that I've, I've got to think about. So overall, um, great prom date, um, marriage proposal possible. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barton. Uh, given the distance that we've traveled, uh, a prom date is good enough for today. And, uh, <laughs> And I'm, I'm and I'm happy to get the invitation. <laughs> um, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm still trying to get that image of Mr. Barton taking you out to the prom out of my head. That's just metaphysical. It's not literal. <laughs> Even that's scary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I'm, I'm pleased that you're 
holding a hearing on your bill to reform the Universal Service Fund. I think we have to rethink what universal service means and, and how the Universal Service Fund implements these goals. Uh, I've said many, many times that we need an overhaul for the broadband age, a universal 2.0. Universal Service 2.0 shouldn't build on the current structure just because it's what we have. That structure should undergo a thorough review to make sure that every dollar spent is a dollar that the private sector isn't competing against and that every dollar spent enables low-income consumers to choose the communication services they need. I think the bill takes a, a number of steps in the right direction, but I have some concerns that I believe have to be addressed before I can support it. Today, my constituents pay a lot of money into that fund, and I want to make sure that the fund just doesn't take from those in urban areas just to hand it over to rural areas uh, who are capable of paying for it themselves. I think that Ms. Matsui's bill that allows for low-income Americans to qualify for a broadband lifeline subsidy is a good start, and I intend to add my name as a co-sponsor. However, although it's critically important in many cases, monthly price isn't always the biggest reason that people aren't online at home. There's the other program, LinkUp, that needs to be addressed also in Universal Service 2.0, because there are other barriers like access to a computer, or even a lack of understanding the benefits of broadband. Some people suggest that we shouldn't be subsidizing telephone service for upper income communities in areas like Aspen, Colorado. Perhaps we need to consider legislation that will move the Universal Service Fund to a voucher system for low income consumers that will allow them to communicate in the ways that they want to. I'm interested in learning if that's a viable solution to meet the goals of Universal Service 2.0. I look forward to hearing from our panelists today, and I look forward to asking some questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate your comments this morning. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, do thank you for the hearing. I know that you and Mr. Terry are hard at work on this issue, and I want to say welcome to all of our uh, our visitors here today. It looks like with the large number of you, we are going to be spending the day together talking about this issue, but I'm glad that you're here, and I, I hope that as we go through this hearing today that we're going to touch on a number of issues um, that really need to be addressed. The intercarrier compensation competitive bill, uh, bidding caps on uh, the USF distribution, the reverse auctioning uh, cost of this to the consumer. Uh, several of us have mentioned these, and as you know, they are of concern to us. Uh, I'm concerned that the legislation in its current form is we're not really addressing, hitting the problems that we're hearing from our constituents. We're just not hitting them head on. And I think the American people have grown ill and fatigued of lots of talk. They want to see some action on some issues. Uh, I'm hearing from some of my constituents who would be affected by this. Why is it not going to dramatically increase access or improve access? Exactly what is going to happen with the broadband plan and expansion? How are you going to handle that? Uh, Mr. Shimkus mentioned net neutrality. I term it fairness doctrine for the Internet. Indeed, uh, there's concern about complications and how that would be handled. Uh, people are concerned that we put taxes on the books and then we don't take taxes off the books, but we cannot always define what is a better use or a fair distribution for those taxes. So there's plenty for us to look at and talk about, and I do hope we're going to have some good common sense coming from all of you. I want to say a special welcome Mr. Chairman, if I may, to Mr. Greer, who is from Tennessee and is someone that I uh, enjoy my conversations with when we talk about how this affects our rural areas. And as we look at uh, the telecommunications issues in the rural areas, I also want to say a special welcome to Mr. Graham, who graduated from Mississippi State University and, like me, a fellow bulldog. Uh, looking at you, I can tell you were there much later in life than, than was I, and uh, that you uh, probably graduated many years after I had left, but welcome. We're glad you're here. I yield back. 
Thank you, Ms. Blackburn. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding this hearing today on reforming the Universal Service Fund. I'd also like to commend your efforts to expand broadband access to more Americans in your draft USF reform legislation. I'd like to thank the witnesses for joining us today. I'd also like to thank um, Ms. Eshoo and Mr. Doyle for their supportive comments on my Broadband Affordability Act. In today's economy, the Internet has become a necessity, not a luxury. Americans need it to obtain emergency information for educational purposes, to find low-cost health care options, and to seek employment assistance. In fact, about 75 percent of all large U.S. employers now require applicants to apply online, creating a significant disadvantage for those without broadband. We need to not only expand broadband access, but also to address the fact that millions of Americans simply cannot afford to pay up to $60 a month for broadband. A recent ITIF study found that 96 percent of Americans have access to broadband services, but less than 65 percent actually subscribe. Other current prominent studies by the Pew Institute and PPIC have strongly suggested <clears throat> that broadband adoption rates are largely associated with income. Lower income families in urban and rural areas are severely disadvantaged, in large part by the lack of access to affordable broadband services. To help close the digital divide, I've introduced the Broadband Affordability Act, which will direct the FCC to create a program for universal broadband adoption, similar to the current USF Lifeline Assistance Program. The bill will ensure that lower income Americans living in urban and suburban and rural areas all have access to affordable broadband services. In doing so, households who currently possess broadband access options but have not subscribed because of costs would no longer be unserved or underserved. It is my hope that any USF reform legislation helps bridge this nation's digital divide by addressing affordability barriers. I look forward to working with uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Terry and all my colleagues looking forward, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Matsui. The uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The topic of today's hearing, Universal Service Fund Reform, is one that it appears everyone has something to say about, judging by the panel of ten witnesses, and we welcome you all. This is a complex matter, so I appreciate your assembling such a thorough uh, complement of witnesses, Mr. Chairman. This should be most helpful. It isn't often that there are two Oregonians uh, in the room for one of our subcommittee hearings, uh, but today is one of those times, and I welcome my friend Ray Baum, who is a commissioner with the Oregon Public Utility Commission and chair of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners uh, Committee on Telecommunications wearing both these hats and as the state chair of the FCC's Joint Board on Universal Service, Ray will share his insight with us on USF reform and I appreciate uh, his testimony which I read through last night. During my years as a state legislator, legislator, I worked alongside Ray and I found his perspective to be both thoughtful and comprehensive and I'm pleased that he's here to help this subcommittee in its efforts to reform the USF. Congress continues to discuss the issue of ubiquitous broadband deployment and how best to achieve it. it. The FCC, USDA, and Commerce Department are engaged in this topic as well. With the nation's unemployment rate at a 26-year high, Oregon's unemployment rate at 11.3 percent, and some counties in my district pushing 20 percent, the economic development potential that broadband service provides cannot come fast enough. I'm interested to learn more about the implications, however, of using USF to support broadband service. I'd like to hear from our witnesses about how this would functionally work in a district as rural as mine that has several counties with population densities less than one person per square mile. If you overlaid my district over the East Coast, it would start at the Atlantic and end in Ohio. I realize that none of our witnesses here today can speak to specific problems within, for example, the USF schools and library program. However, I would like the hearing record to reflect that we should address the challenges that applicants face in navigating this very complex program. My office has been working with the Baker County, Oregon Library District for a year and a half on delays it has experienced with receiving E-rate funds. If it is the intent of the USF program to support schools and libraries through the E-rate program, 
then let's make sure it functions properly, remove roadblocks which cause applicants to give up completely on that program. So I welcome the witnesses here today, and I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Walden. The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, and, and thank you and Ranking Member Stearns for holding this hearing to receive testimony on the draft of the Universal Service Fund Act. I also want to commend you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Terry, for your work in drafting the bill and your long-term legislative efforts to try to keep the Universal Service Fund program in sync with a rapidly changing technology landscape. I'm pleased that today we'll have an opportunity to have a meaningful discussion of the issues that are important to reforming the USF, including the overall budget for the high cost fund, new contribution methodology, and expanding the USF to support broadband adoption, among others. I think everyone is in agreement on the need for reform, but also on preserving the intent codified in the 1996 Act, which is to provide affordable telecommunication services across the United States. As a representative of a district that is a high-cost insular area, which reportedly received high and an estimated $22.5 million in high-cost support in 2007, we have benefited from the programs. However, in some areas like the Virgin Islands, funding has been declining for wireless, wireline carriers, which represents a serious threat to the need for increased investment in the telecommunication infrastructure in rural areas. It's important that places like the Virgin Islands, rural areas with minimal level competition in a small market, are, that they're not left out or left behind or underserved by this critical industry. So I look forward to our discussion today on challenges to reforming and taking the USF into the 21st century. And I want to welcome the panelists and look forward to the testimony and their views on the bill. Thank you. Thank you, you very much, uh, Ms. Christensen. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement for the record. Let me just quickly summarize that statement, uh, which is really how do we how do we bring down the rapidly growing cost to uh, customers, to consumers here? Uh, the, the whole topic of unserved versus underserved is of concern to me, uh, and how do we control the cost of the program? And is the combination is the is the definition of uh, underserved and served part of that? And uh, I'll submit my full statement for the record, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Blunt. The uh, gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, is recognized for two minutes. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing and for the progress that you and Representative Terry have made in beginning to craft a bill. Uh, my state of Florida has a particular interest in universal service reform because out of all the states in the union, Florida is the single, single largest contributor to the fund. In 2007, Florida consumers made a net contribution of $297 million to the Universal Service Fund. Uh, Floridians paid in about $480 million and received $180 million of that back in support, largely for schools and libraries. Uh, the overriding goal of the USF is laudable, but it is unclear that the draft adequately addresses inequities in distribution or modernizes the USF with concepts like those contained in Congresswoman Matsui's bill relating to broadband and low-income consumers. Florida's disproportionate uh, contribution has only been exacerbated by the out-of-control growth and the high-cost fund. So I'm pleased that the discussion draft contains a cap on the high-cost fund and other measures to hold down the growth in the fund. Uh, I'm interested in the witnesses' opinions regarding the auction mechanisms uh, and whether such auctions will be effective in reducing the growth in wasteful and duplicative spending that has been driven by the identical support rule. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, prior to markup, it would be helpful to see an analysis uh, monetarily of the effect of these changes. Several of the changes proposed in this bill have the potential to further grow the fund, and while I understand the importance of some of these changes, I do not believe we should expand the fund except in the context of a solution to the inequities in the contribution and distribution methodology that exists today. Thank you, and I look forward to the testimony of the panel. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Castor. 
Um, is Mr. Bowyer here? No, he has not arrived. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll wave and ask for an extra two minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stupak. Two minutes will be added to your questioning time. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher and Ranking Member Stearns for convening today's hearing. I'd also like to thank our witnesses for taking their time to be here today as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud your efforts along with those of uh, Mr. Terry to reform the Universal Service Fund through the draft legislation that we're considering today. Uh, as I've shared many times before, uh, the 18th Congressional District is largely, largely rural. Uh, 14 of my 16 counties are within Appalachian proper. And that said, we are the poster child for the Universal Service Fund support. Many of our towns are small, insular, uh, and expensive for providers to serve. And much of my district consequently lacks access to broadband. And uh, as my uh, colleague uh, from Oregon stated, this has a, an extremely uh, uh, significant uh, effect on our economic development and the potential afforded uh, uh, by uh, the advent of new and uh, diverse technology. It also has an extremely detrimental effect on our ability to deliver health care and education. Uh, we're, what we're seeing now is really the beginning of the integration of technology into those processes, and we can no longer afford uh, to remain so far behind in such a vital area. I am extremely pleased to see that Chairman Boucher and Congressman Terry's draft bill explicitly authorizes the coverage uh, of broadband under the Universal High Cost Fund. I believe that coupled with the investment we made through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we are on the path to ensuring that Americans everywhere, regardless of how rural their hometown is, may have equitable access to vital infrastructure. I further support the efforts of my colleagues to restore some accountability and cost containment to the Universal Service Fund through sensible auditing and oversight provisions and through capping the fund with built-in accommodations for future changes. I look forward to continuing to work on Universal for, uh, Service Fund reform with my colleagues on this committee, and I think, I think we all agree that such reform is long past overdue and that rural areas of our country have, in the meantime, gone shortchanged. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Space. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you. I'm going to reserve my time. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. The uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll waive my uh, opening statement. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, is recognized for two minutes. Let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your outstanding work on this issue and for the work you and your staff have put into developing your Universal Service Reform Act discussion draft. Uh, as a member of this committee who represents a particularly rural district in my state of North Carolina, I am acutely aware of the need for the USF and to ensure uh, telecommunication services are made available to the high-cost remote areas of our country. At the same time, should we do nothing uh, to reform USF, uh, we put ourselves on an unsustainable path, a path that already projects the contribution factor rising to over 14 percent in the coming year. I am pleased to see much needed provisions addressed in the Boucher Terry Universal Service Draft, including requiring USF recipients to include broadband Internet access, uh, broadening the base of contributors to help bring down the rising uh, contribution factor, uh, directing the FCC to address the intercarrier uh, compensation system, and targeting support to rural wire centers as opposed to a formula based on statewide averaging. And these are steps in the right direction. And I look forward to hearing the comments from the witnesses before us today and also from my colleagues about these and other proposals. Uh, finally, I remain particularly interested in the comments of Dr. Roban uh, regarding much-needed reforms in the rural health care program. That's very special to me. Uh, we have not been able to achieve the full effectiveness of this program, and I look forward to discussing how the addition of broadband services and USF will potentially enhance broadband telehealth infrastructure and deployment in the rural health care program. I have been an advocate of telehealth and telemedicine, and I believe these health care delivery tools will be vital in rural communities across America. And so I want to thank the 10 witnesses. I sat here and counted all of you. I want to thank the 10 witnesses on the panel, and I look forward uh, to hearing your testimonies today. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. 
The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, and I'll pass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Inslee. Uh, all members now having had an opportunity for opening statements, we welcome our panel of witnesses, and we thank each of you for taking time to join us here this morning. I'll say just a brief word of introduction uh, about our witnesses today. Mr. Peter Davidson is Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Policy, and Communications for Verizon. Mr. Leslie Greer is the Chief Executive Officer of DTC Communications, testifying this morning on behalf of the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association, a very large organization representing rural carriers. Mr. Michael Rhoda is the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at Windstream Communications. Mr. Joel Lubin is a Vice President of Public Policy for AT&T Services Incorporated. Ms. Catherine Moyer is the Director of Legal and Regulatory Affairs for Pioneer Communications, testifying today on behalf of OPATSCO. The Honorable Ray Baum is a Commissioner of the Oregon Public Utility Commission, testifying today on behalf of NARUC. Kyle McSlaro is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Cable Television Association. Mr. Eric Graham is Vice President of Government Relations at Cellular South Incorporated, testifying today on behalf of the Rural Cellular Association. Dr. Karen Ruban is a Professor of Pediatrics and the Medical Director of the Office of Telemedicine at the University of Virginia Health Systems. She also serves as President of the American Telemedicine Association and as Board Chair of the Virginia Telehealth Network. Mr. Gregory Roston is a Deputy Director at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research at Stanford University. Without objection, all of your opening statements will be made a part of the record, and we would encourage your oral summaries, and given the um, number of you this morning, we would ask that you try to hold those statements to approximately five minutes. Mr. Davidson, we'll be happy to begin with you. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairman Boucher, uh, Ranking Member Stearns, and member of, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee uh, this morning on the new Universal Service Reform Act of 2009, circulated recently by Chairman Boucher and Mr. Terry. This committee has always been a leading voice on universal service reform, and today we endorse the Boucher-Terry legislation because we believe it embraces policies to reform and sustain the fund. It directs funds to meet the true communications needs of consumers. We will continue to work with the sponsors and this committee to ensure that this legislation accomplishes the objectives of modernizing the Universal Service Program so that it meets the needs of Americans in the 21st century. In the past decade, the communications industry has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in private capital to deploy new, innovative broadband technologies. Recently, Congress passed mapping legislation funded broadband grants for unserved areas, and now we have a full complement of FCC commissioners focusing on broadband adoption and deployment policies. Encouraging deployment and adoption of next generation networks will keep America competitive in our global economy and will help address some of our most pressing challenges, such as health care reform, education, and energy conservation. We also believe that there should be a role for the Universal Service Fund related to broadband. But right now, the fund is in trouble and left unchanged is in no shape to contribute to the broadband solution. The USF contribution factor is near an all-time high, and just to pay the fund today, at today's levels, as everyone has noted this morning, is projected to rise again next year to more than 14 percent. When added to other communications charges and fees, these assessments really hit consumers hard, especially in these economic times, and this trend is simply unsustainable. The problem with universal service is not that we spend too little money, it's that we do not spend it on the right services in the right places. We cannot put off any longer the tough choices on major issues. We must fix the broken universal service framework before layering on additional priorities. Verizon supports the draft Universal Service Reform Act because it takes a big step toward addressing five of the most pressing issues. One, an overall budget for the high cost fund. Two, a contribution methodology. Three, competitive bidding for wireless support. Four, 
a date certain for related reform of intercarrier compensation, and five, an end to traffic pumping. Allow me to briefly, and I will be brief, address each of these points. First, the bill recognizes the need to set an overall budget for the high cost fund. This is important because consumers pay for the fund, having grown uh, and consumers have limited resources. The high cost fund is already at a tipping point, having grown uh, to about $4.5 billion from less than $3.5 billion only five years ago, while the assessable revenue base declines rapidly. Without some restraint, the USF contribution factor will surely rise to 15 percent, perhaps even 20 percent or more. We simply must have the discipline at the outset of any overhaul of the high cost fund to define some reasonable funding boundaries. Second, the way that we fund the fund and it, through an assessment of, on interstate revenues is a mess. This system may have worked in the days of one network and only two services, local and long distance calls, but it's not practical with the converged any distance services consumers expect today. The draft bill acknowledges the need to update the universal service contribution system and would commit the FCC to take a hard look at an alternative contribution system. For many reasons, the best contribution method is one mentioned in the bill, a flat charge on each working phone number to pay for all or part of the US contribution base, the USF contribution base. Third, a competitive bidding system is the best way to distribute high cost support to wireless carriers. The draft bill recognizes the benefits of this market-based approach and sensibly puts in place a forward-looking competitive bidding system to support and expand the reach of wireless networks. The FCC will need to address quality of service requirements and rules in, in a competitive bidding system, but that is manageable through legally enforceable contracts signed with those wireless carriers that win the bid to provide service in high-cost areas just as the federal government does in hundreds of procurement areas to ensure quality of goods and services. Fourth, we must fix the broken intercarrier compensation system at the same time that we update the Universal Service Fund. All that's needed is a resolve to get this done, and the draft Universal Service Reform Act requires the FCC to act on intercarrier compensation, compensation reform within one year. That is certainly workable. And fifth, we have to stop the so-called traffic pumping schemes that have plagued the industry the last several years. The Draft Universal Service Reform Act would help do that by making it illegal for traffic pumpers to charge other carriers for access on traffic subject to those revenue sharing agreements. Mr. Chairman, um, with your and the committee's leadership, the Universal Service Reform Act, uh, we, can get through, uh, we can get the fund back on the path of sustainability and focused on meeting the telecommunications needs of our country. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify here this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Davidson. Mr. Greer. Chairman Bout, Ranking Member Stearns, members of the subcommittee, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to participate in today's discussion regarding the Universal Service Reform Act of 2009. My name is Leslie Greer. I'm the CEO of DTC Communications in Alexandria, Tennessee. As a resident of Tennessee, I'd like to take this unique opportunity to thank Representatives Gordon and Representative Blackburn for their service on the subcommittee and to our great state. My remarks today are on behalf of DTC Communication as well as NTCA and its other 580-plus community-based members that serve rural areas throughout our nation. NTCA would like to recognize Chairman Boucher and Representative Terry for their longstanding focus and awareness of the critical need for continued universal service support for our nation's telecommunication network, which will help usher in the new era of advanced communication. The Universal Service Reform Act contains many program modifications we have advocated for many years. I will briefly outline our position on some of the most critical provisions of the bill from a rural provider's perspective. However, I would like to remind the subcommittee that further analysis of these provisions and others can be found in my written testimony. Government policies and programs, including universal service, are instrumental to the realization of affordable and comparable telephone service for all. The United States public switch telecommunication network remains the envy of the world. The same should be true for the United States national broadband network. The Universal Service Reform Act make, takes many important steps toward making this a reality. However, to achieve truly ubiquitous broadband, much more needs to be done. Therefore, NTCA looks forward to continue working with the FCC in the coming months to develop a national broadband plan to meet the needs of broadband networks in high-cost rural areas throughout the country to ensure Americans living in these areas are not denied the opportunity to re realize the full promise of the Internet. 
The bill would expand assessments of contributions. NTCA supports this change and believes all broadband access providers should contribute to the Universal Service Fund. This change alone will dramatically reduce the quarterly contribution factor on all providers while t simultaneously ensuring that all those who utilize and benefit from the network are in fact supporting it. The bill gives the FCC the authority to determine whether to use a contribution methodology based on revenues, numbers, or a combination of the two and requires a study and findings in support of the method chosen. Telephone numbers have nothing to do with broadband internet access, which will be the basis for all communication services in the future. With this in mind, as well as other provisions that ensure all revenues may be assessed, it is clear the FCC study will have to arrive at the correct conclusion that the tested and proven revenues approach must be used. NTCA recognizes the fundamental roles audits play in the oversight of policies and programs if they are conducted appropriately. Unfortunately, the audit process is mostly a failure. Therefore, we support efforts by Congress and the provisions included in this bill to ensure the FCC uses appropriate audit methodologies. The solution for intercarrier compensation is a simple one. If a service provider uses another provider's network, that service provider must compensate the other provider for such use at an appropriate rate. We fully support the bill's provisions directing the FCC to reform intercarrier compensation within one year. The Universal Service Reform Act requires carriers to identify all traffic on their network and to pass through traffic identification details. NTCA supports this provision to eliminate phantom traffic, which has become one of the most pervasive problems facing the telecommunications industry today. NTCA supports the elimination of the FCC's longstanding arcane and nonsensical identical support rule that allows a competitor in a given market to receive support based on the incumbent's embedded cost, even though the competitor's costs are usually far less because they have not been required to serve all customers throughout the market area as incumbents have been. The draft contains other provisions that will help ensure this program's effective operations, including primary line and anti-deficiency act prohibitions, removal of the parent trap, and allowances to accommodate potential future regulatory shifts of intercarrier compensation or access charges within the universal service system. With these things in mind, we support passage of this bill. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Greer. Mr. Rota. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity this morning to discuss our views on the draft text of the Universal Service Reform Act of 2009. My name is Mike Rhoda, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at Windstream, which provides communications and entertainment services to consumers in 16 states. Windstream serves more than 3 million voice customers and more than 1 million high-speed Internet customers. We provide affordable broadband services at speeds of at least 3 meg to virtually every community in our service territory, and we've deployed high-speed Internet access to more than 90 percent of our voice customers. Windstream service areas are primarily rural, with an average density of 19 customers per square mile. Mr. Chairman, let me say that I have great respect for your and Mr. Terry's work uh, and thanks to your bipartisan leadership, the draft bill fairly balances the many conflicting interests in this complex area. Windstream supports passage of this bill. Unlike other rural carriers, Windstream receives relatively little high-cost support on a per-line basis. Instead, Windstream must implicitly subsidize service for customers in remote high-cost areas with revenues from its customers in larger, more densely populated towns. More than a decade ago, Congress recognized in Section 254 of the Communications Act that such implicit subsidies would be unsustainable in a competitive telecommunications marketplace. And unfortunately, universal service regulations remain virtually unchanged since that time. We've seen the programming's shortcomings up close. A good example is one of our customers residing in, a, in rural Nebraska who recently contacted us to ask why he could not purchase broadband at speeds comparable to his rural neighbors down the road. His neighbors are served by a smaller company whose network has been modernized by universal service. His frustration is understandable. Windstream's commitment to deploying affordable broadband in rural America is undeniable. But existing universal service mechanisms have created drastic imbalances in rural Nebraska and in rural America at large. Some high-cost areas receive arguably too much support 
while many others receive far too little or no support at all. While the neighboring companies in this example receive an average of $800 annually per line in support, Windstream's Nebraska operations receive approximately $10 per line annually. The Boucher Terry Bill takes a large step towards eliminating these disparities in high cost rural areas by narrowly targeting support to those areas that need it most. The bill's use of targeting eliminates two significant shortcomings of the current system. First, under the rule mechanism, price cap carriers' costs are averaged across study areas, which can cover vast geographies. A single windstream study area stretches the full width of Texas, a distance of more than 700 miles, and contains nearly 200 exchanges, ranging in size from 44,000 customers to 47. With competitive pressures mounting in lower cost, more densely populated areas, severe strains are placed on a carrier's operations because low-cost wire centers no longer generate sufficient revenues to offset costs in remote, higher-cost areas. The second problem lies with the non-rule mechanism's classification of entire states as either eligible or not eligible based on statewide average cost. This limitation disqualifies rural areas in a state like California from receiving support no matter how small, how remote, or how costly a community is to serve. The Boucher-Terry draft establishes a sensible transition path for incorporating broadband into universal service. The strength of the Boucher-Terry draft is that it sets the nation on a path to universal broadband, but with recognition of the significant costs to achieve this goal and an opportunity to amortize those costs over time. Finally, Windstream strongly supports the bill's recognition of the important role that revenues from the existing intercarrier compensation mechanisms play in offsetting the high costs in rural areas. Many on this subcommittee remember that one year ago, the FCC considered a proposal to eliminate most intercarrier compensation revenues. That proposal would have been disastrous for consumers and businesses in high cost rural areas. Windstream recognizes that the current rates and arcane rules of intercarrier compensation are unsustainable, and the company has presented practical alternatives to the FCC that would not hobble the ability of mid-sized carriers to serve rural consumers. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to assure all members of this subcommittee that there is broad agreement within the telecom industry on the need for significant universal service reform, and that that reform is long overdue. While reforms carry certain risks, the larger risk is to stand by and watch well-documented problems continue to pull down communities and consumers residing in rural America. Significant change is the only way to save this program and position it to fulfill its mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rhoda. Mr. Lubin. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and other members of the subcommittee for again including AT&T in this um, uh, continuing dialogue of universal service reform. AT&T is the largest provider of telephone service to rural America. This is the second time I've had the opportunity to address this committee, subcommittee, this year. The first time was in March of 2009. At that point in time when we were talking about high cost universal service reform, we AT&T identified three critical areas that needed to be addressed. The first one was contribution reform. Contribution reform is so important because it's all about what customers pay and which customers pay. The second was intercarrier compensation. Intercarrier compensation is critical because it's just another form of subsidization to rural America. The third is once and for all to identify an explicit endorsement for the use of high cost universal service mechanisms to promote the deployment of next generation broadband and expanded and improved wireless in rural areas. Let me highlight, Mr. Chairman and Representative Terry, I would wish to congratulate you for this legislation when introduced and enacted will address the three items that AT&T highlighted in March of 2009. We support and endorse this legislation. From AT&T's perspective, universal service 
as it exists today at both the federal and state levels is fundamentally grounded on a dying business model and a dying regulatory model, which no longer serves the foundation of sustainable social policy. The plain old telephone service POTS, by which local exchange providers provide basic local exchange service with inter-exchange access to long distance service, will soon go by the way of a slide roll, an earlier casualty of digital technology. In today's communications marketplace, the only thing falling faster than subscribers on local basic service called POTS is the switched access minutes on these collective networks. In these circumstances, no government could hope to prop up the POTS model for long, even if it wanted to, in order to sustain universal service. Instead, universal service reform must be forward-looking and policymakers must continue to work on comprehensive national universal service reform policies in order to promote and advance universal service objectives for the 21st century. The Universal Service Reform Act of 2009 both appropriately reflects the insights of its sponsors and the committee leadership and recognizes the reality of the rapidly eroding implicit subsidies in the disappearing switched access world, as well as the need to establish explicit funding mechanisms in order to ensure universal service objectives are met for the 21st century. Let me return to the three pressing areas of reform that I described before. First is the respect to contribution reform. The importance of this provision cannot be overemphasized. According to the preliminary number submitted by the Universal Service Administration Company of, to the FCC a few weeks ago, the assessment rate could approach and exceed over 14 percent of interstate telecommunications revenues. When I was here in March of 2009, that factor was 9.5 percent. In less than a year, we see a 50 percent increase. We have asked the FCC to act on a longstanding proposal by AT&T and Verizon, which is supported by a number of individual companies and individual associations, to implement a telephone numbers-based contribution mechanism that would address the problem posed by the overall reduction of interstate revenues, which is the basis for the universal service contribution base. This would create a more stable, robust collection mechanism for universal service. This is of critical importance to the goal of providing more explicit support for a, band, for a broadband deployment. Second is the section on intercarrier compensation reform is also critical for the transition to full deployment of broadband, which will accelerate the complete, underline the word complete, elimination of access charges as a source of universal service funding. We can debate what the rate is, but a rate times zero minutes is going to generate zero dollars. And ultimately the question is, if that was supporting universal service, how does it work in a broadband world? We have needed intercarrier compensation reform for years, and the importance of this draft measures requirement that the Commission act within one year to complete reform initiatives cannot be overstated. Further, the bill makes access stimulation charge, some people call it access pumping, an unreasonable practice under the Commission's Communication Act and prohibits local exchange carriers from assessing access stimulation or traffic pumping charges. Third, AT&T is pleased that the bill creates a statutory framework that once and for all removes any doubt that it is the policy of the United States that the federal high cost funding mechanism be used to promote deployment of broadband and expanded and improved wireless in rural areas. We look forward to hearing from the other panelists and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lubin. Ms. Moyer. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. I am Catherine Moyer, Director of Legal and Regulatory Affairs for Pioneer Communications. Pioneer Communications is a rural telephone company headquartered in Ulysses, Kansas. 
Pioneer provides local. Uh, Ms. Moyer, let me get you to move that microphone sure. just a little bit closer and maybe tilt it up a little bit so that you're speaking directly into it. Thank you. Pioneer provides local telephone service to approximately 14,000 access lines within a 5,000 square mile service area. Of these 5,000 square miles, only about 15 square miles could be considered town. The remainder of our area is truly rural. In addition to phone service, Pioneer Communications provides cable television service, internet access, and wireless phone service. I testify today as first vice chairman of the Organization for the Promotion and Advancement of Small Telecommunication Companies, OPASCO. OPASCO represents more than 530 independently owned local exchange carriers in 47 states. The companies and cooperatives represented by this association provide numerous services to their communities, including voice, broadband internet access, video, and wireless. First of all, let me state our appreciation to Chairman Boucher and to Congressman Terry for the leadership that both have shown on the reform of the Universal Service Fund. This program has a successful history of assisting communications network providers in their service to rural and low-income consumers. We look forward to working with Congress and the Federal Communications Commission to make the USF a part of a forward-looking solution in the ever-changing communications arena. The goal of universal service policy has been to ensure that every American, regardless of their location, has affordable, high-quality access to the public switch network and thereby, thereby benefits from a variety of telecommunications and information services. The provision of a robust telecommunications infrastructure in rural America would never have been possible were it not for the nation's long-established policy of universal service and the federal USF. To rural incumbent local exchange carriers, high-cost universal service support is a cost recovery program designed to promote infrastructure investment in areas where it would not otherwise be feasible for carriers to provide quality service at rates that are affordable and reasonably comparable to urban areas of the country. I come before you today to endorse and support the draft legislation offered by Chairman Boucher and Congressman Terry. While the membership of OPASCO has concerns about some of the specifics contained in the text, the draft is a forward-looking document. We commend Congressman Boucher and Terry for their understanding of the ongoing revenue stream the USF provides and how it benefits consumers in rural and hard-to-reach areas of our country. This ongoing revenue stream keeps rates affordable for rural consumers as carriers utilize it to pay for switching, transport, and network maintenance. This draft transitions the plain old telephone support fund into a new and modern broadband support fund. The draft continues the call for universal service support that allows consumers in rural, insular, or high cost areas to have services and rates reasonably comparable to those provided in urban, urban areas. Its contribution mechanisms will allow for the continued support of schools and libraries, rural health care, and low income consumers. This draft expands universal service support to include high-speed broadband service and any other service that is determined to be a universal service by the FCC. We applaud this forward-looking move to provide support for the broadband platform. Broadband is rapidly becoming the mode of delivery, delivery for practically everything consumers may need or want regarding communications, voice, data, education, healthcare, and entertainment, just to list a few. Recipients of the high-cost fund support would be required to provide high-speed broadband service defined as a download rate of 1.5 megabits per second. This draft mandates that the FCC review that speed requirement biennially and make, adjustments, uh, make necessary adjustments. OPASCA suggests that the FCC also review the USS funding level and ensure that the amount allows for the adjusted speed requirements. Additionally, OPASCA supports the eligibility criteria and waiver process included in the draft which take into consideration the many difficulties experienced by communication providers in rural and hard to reach areas. Additionally, OPASCO supports one, broadening the base of contributors to the USF. Expanding this base recognizes our modern broadband world. A broadband network with the most possible connections, regardless of technology, is the most valuable network. Two, the cost control controls included with the limitation of the number of competitive carriers that receive support. Three, the recognition of the importance of intercarrier compensation and its relationship to USF with the mandate that the FCC act on intercarrier comp reform within one year. Four, the permanent exemption of the USF from the Anti-Deficiency Act. Five, the prohibition of the primary line rule. And six, the audit procedures, performance measures, and reports to Congress. In closing, OPASCO endorses and supports draft, legislations off draft legislation offered by Chairman Boucher and Congressman Terry. OPASCO and its members look forward to working with Congressman Boucher and Terry, members of this subcommittee, and members of Congress to ensure the consumers in rural America are not left behind and that they have access to services and rates that are reasonably comparable to those provided in urban areas. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Moyer. Commissioner Baum. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of the committee today. 
I want to do a little side note. When Commissioner Wall and I were serving in the Oregon legislature, we were so young, we were known as the Pablum Twins. <laughs> I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for Congress sharing that, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> and and we've, we've grown up, as you can tell. We, I'd like to thank you and Congressman Terry for your leadership on this important issue. I'm here today in my capacity as a member of the Oregon Public Utility Commission and chair of the NARUC Telecommunications Committee and state chair of the federal state joint board on universal service. It's my personal belief that broadband deployment is essential to the economic development and quality of life of the rural communities of America. Those rural communities who don't have adequate broadband would be just as disadvantaged economically as those rural communities in the first half of the 20th century that did not have electricity access to electricity or paved highways. Reform of intercarrier comp and USF is essential to that broadband deployment. I begin by testifying on behalf of NARUC. NARUC specifically endorses the following provisions of the bill. The provision that protects the state's ability to assess USF funds, that that fund generates $1.3 billion for the states in 23 different states through that contribution base. We are grateful for the opportunity to continue to assess that. We also support the Anti-Deficiency Act exemptions. We also support the continued role of the Federal State Joint Board on Universal Service in recommending USF reform and in designating supported services. We would suggest that after the initial 18-month period that the bill requires the FCC to act, that you add an additional one-year time clock on the FCC to act on any further Joint Board recommendations. We're very pleased with the language requiring compliance with applicable state and federal consumer protections and service quality standards. This is key to consumer protection and it keeps the state consumer cops on the beat. We do have some concerns about the preemption language in uh, interstate rate setting. We would propose that we use a more cooperative approach, conditioning receipt of USF funds in states that mirror the interstate rate and in return for the foregone interstate revenues, the, those funds would be transferred to the federal fund. In any case, we're committed to working with you on modifying this provision of the bill. The remaining issues NARIC has not taken a position on, so I will speak to them as, on, based on my own opinion, as my experience as chair of the, of the uh, Universal Service Joint Board and as former chairman of the NARIC Intercarrier Compensation Task Force. I note that the draft legislation echoes many of the provisions in the Joint Board's recommendation of two years ago. I applaud you for designating broadband as a supported service. Two years ago this month, the Joint Board made that same recommendation. I would encourage you to make sure the deployment, would be con de deployment of broadband should be a condition of receiving universal service funding. The high cost fund should be transitioned to a broadband fund and it should focus on unserved areas and anchor institutions. Mr. Chairman, I believe your 1.5 megabits is a good start. But let me just suggest to you that it might be better to realize what's coming in the future. I want to kind of up the ante. I think it's 3 to 5 megabits for residential customers and 20 to 50 megabits for anchor institutions has to be the minimum if we're going to face the new broadband world with appropriate waivers for certain unserved areas. These service levels are already standard in most urban areas and should be comparatively available in high-cost rural areas as required in the draft legislation. The White House auction provisions of the bill are a positive step in the right direction. It's a de facto repeal of the identical support rule. However, there is a seismic shift in the wireless broadband looming on the horizon in open networks. It will be the communication device of choice. People want to be mobile and want to have broadband. This looming reality is coming upon us and it involves huge amounts of spectrum and exponential increases in backbone capacity. I would urge you too to encourage the FCC to transition intercarrier compensation rates to zero in a five to seven year period. They are going away anyway and we might as well plan for it and it won't work at all in the broadband world. We need to focus on the efficient use of the funds. I also want to add my support to the provisions on phantom traffic, traffic pumping, auditing, capping the fund, which the Joint Board originally recommended, subject to ad appropriate adjustments on, based on intercarry compensation reform and the repeal of the parent trap. The Universal Service Fund should be based as much as possible on forward-looking cost models and on uh, based on a wire center basis as we go forward. 
Mr. Chairman, expeditious implementations of the major provisions of this draft legislation will greatly mitigate the digital divide that exists today between urban and rural America and will prevent that divide from becoming an irreversible chasm. I personally support the major provisions of your bill. We cannot address these issues soon enough. The Joint Board is committed to working with you and the FCC in achieving these goals. We thank you again for your leadership. Thank you very much, Commissioner Baum. Mr. McSlaro. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Stearns, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for having me here. Mr. Chairman, I, I fully appreciate uh, the difficulty in assembling uh, this jigsaw puzzle known as Universal Service Fund Reform, and I congratulate you and Mr. Terry on producing a discussion draft, which I think is a valuable step toward addressing issues like cost containment, uh, injecting notions of competitive neutrality, both on the distribution side and on the contribution side. Um, I want to just, in the time I have, uh, focus on one area where I think uh, the draft might be improved. Uh, with a proposal that I think complements the direction that you and Mr. Terry are taking uh, these reforms. And it is to, and it is to note, uh, I know that members of the subcommittee are aware that the cable industry uh, offers broadband service to 92 percent of American households. Less well known, perhaps, is that we offer phone service, competitive phone service, to 80 percent of American households, and I'm told it's going to actually reach 90 percent uh, by the end of this year. In less than a decade, we've gone from less than a million phone customers to over 20 million. And with very few exceptions, cable digital phone service is unsubsidized by the Universal Service Fund reform. So our view is that that change in the competitive landscape as you think about the future of universal service ought to mean something. Our proposal is this. Um, that in the rural study areas, for example, that receive high cost support today, we already know that 40 percent of those rural study areas have a wireline unsubsidized competitor, usually a cable company, but not necessarily. We don't actually know the answer in those other areas because of statewide averaging, it's harder to know for the non-rural local exchange carriers. But in those markets, in those areas where we would say there is a competitive, unsubsidized wireline phone service to more than 75 percent of households, we would say universal service fund, high cost universal service fund support should cease in that marketplace. The alternative is in those regions or states where the state legislature has itself determined that the level of competition means that the uh, retail rates of an incumbent carrier should be priced to regulated. We also would say that that would be evidence that there is extant competition such that universal service fund support should cease. So our proposal that we'd submit respectfully for your consideration is that we set up a process at the FCC where people can make a showing with one of those two triggers, either evidence of significant competition, evidence of deregulation by the states, and set up a process where people can figure out how to focus on those non-competitive areas where there indeed might still be requirements for high cost support. Every member of this subcommittee today, I think, has in one way or another suggested that they want to put more dollars on target in the most efficient way possible. I think injecting notions of the changed competitive landscape will help you toward that goal. I look forward to answering your questions on that or other parts of the discussion draft. Thank you very much, Mr. McSlaro. Mr. Graham. Mr. Chairman, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to be here today to present testimony on behalf of Cellular South and as a carrier member of the Rural Cellular Association. RCA's nearly 100 carrier members provide commercial wireless services covering approximately 83 percent of the nation's geography. As you would expect, much of this territory is in rural areas, and therefore many RCA members, including Cellular South, are eligible to participate in the Federal Universal Service Program. These carriers are using support to build high-quality networks in some of the most rural areas of the country. I cannot emphasize enough that for many rural areas, universal service support is the difference between high-quality wireless service and no coverage at all. Today, citizens in thousands of places across the country, such as Floyd, Virginia, and Spray, Oregon, Grand Isle, Maine, Bunker Hill, Illinois, and many others are receiving wireless service as a result of the Universal Service Program. 
For its part, Cellular South has a long history of serving rural areas and has used universal service support to provide service in places like Ellisville, Mississippi that simply would not have coverage otherwise. This program has allowed Cellular South to build a network that covers over 90 percent of the state of Mississippi and upon which cities, counties, and state agencies depend for reliable wireless services. RCA believes in rural America and its members value the people who live there. In Cellular South's 20 years of serving rural areas, we have come to understand what rural consumers want in their wireless service. It's very simple. They want the same things that people in Washington, D.C., Boston, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, California, and New York City want. Quality coverage, modern technology, the latest devices, and the ability to access compatible networks wherever they go. While Congress works to modernize and otherwise reform the Universal Service Fund, it is critical to keep in mind that device exclusivity and data roaming issues must also be resolved if Congress still believes that rural Americans should have services that are reasonably comparable to those in urban areas. Today, consumers demand broadband and mobility. Policymakers and those of us in the telecom industry have seen this coming for years, and everyone in this room has acknowledged the need for more broadband services. Yet since 2001, the FCC has not released an order that would promote rural consumers' access to these services. Between 2000 and 2008, the FCC subsidized wireline voice service to the tune of approximately $26.3 billion while funding wireless voice services at approximately $4.6 billion. Broadband services received zero. The universal service mechanism cannot continue to support fixed voice service, 19th century technology, at a rate of over $3 billion per year. As the world evolves toward broadband and mobile services, so too should the fund's distribution mechanism. Accordingly, RCA supports Chairman Boucher's proposal to include broadband as a supported service within the Universal Service Fund. However, it is absolutely critical that the distribution of universal service support is competitively neutral. In other words, the distribution mechanism must not favor or disfavor any technology or class of carrier. More than that, it should not protect any technology or class of carrier. Support should be portable, and new entrants and incumbents alike should be allowed to compete for customers. This puts consumers in charge by increasing choices and consumer choice increases service quality and lowers prices. RCA is not convinced that reverse auctions for just one class of carrier are consistent with the principle of competitive neutrality. To be clear, RCA fully accepts the need to sustain the fund. However, we do not believe that reverse auctions are the solution because they sacrifice the goals of universal service in the name of sustainability. There are a number of structural issues that must be overcome before competitive bidding can be a realistic option. First and foremost, we have not seen an auction mechanism proposed that eliminates the opportunity for USF opponents to game the system by submitting artificially low bids in order to drive out competition. Assuming you could avoid that problem, the proposed auction system would limit support in an area to a maximum of two providers for a period of up to 10 years. This ensures that no new providers will enter that area, and it forces policymakers into the position of regulating an artificial marketplace, a monopoly or a duopoly. Furthermore, if the goal of reverse auctions is to lessen support in a given area and thereby reduce the size of the fund, there is no certainty that it will happen under reverse auctions. Finally, as proposed, reverse auctions exempt the largest category of recipients from the high cost portion of the Universal Service Fund. In conclusion, RCA believes that support in a high cost area should be fixed at the amount needed to deliver reasonably comparable high quality services to consumers, with support only being awarded when a carrier gets a customer and with that support being taken away when the carrier loses a customer. We believe that no one should be insulated from competition, and we believe that new entrants should be allowed into markets to maximize competition and improve choices and service for consumers. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham. Uh, we have several provisions in the draft that address the Rural Health Care Fund, and Dr. Ruban and her comments will address those provisions. Dr. Ruban. And you'll need to turn that on. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and other distinguished subcommittee members. My name is Dr. Karen Ruban, and I'm a practicing pediatric cardiologist and medical director of the Office of Telemedicine at the University of Virginia. I'm also honored to serve as president of the American Telemedicine Association. 
Thank you for this opportunity to testify and support the draft Universal Service Reform Bill. The health reform debate has galvanized our nation. The powerful tools of telemedicine and health information technologies are key to a transition from care delivered episodically in a balkanized model to an integrated systems approach. Sound policies must facilitate ubiquitous and affordable access to the broadband infrastructure to support access to health care using advanced technologies, especially for our rural Americans. The need for access to care is greater than ever before. Our nation faces a critical shortage of physicians with a projected deficit of 200,000 doctors by 2020. The aging of our population has created increased demand for health care services. Access to specialty care is inadequate for many Americans. Telemedicine programs can be found in every state, offering clinical services that span the entire spectrum of health care. At UVA, we've been privileged to work with Chairman Boucher to deploy an extensive telemedicine network connecting more than 30 federally qualified health centers, clinics, hospitals, schools, and correctional facilities in his district, in addition to other regions of the Commonwealth. Medical specialty societies have endorsed telehealth as an effective tool for the delivery of care. As an example, during an acute stroke, life-saving clot-busting therapies administered by stroke neurologists through telemedicine have been proven to reduce the morbidity, mortality, burden, and cost of stroke. Telemedicine programs improve access to prenatal care. The University of Arkansas now reports a 26% reduction in neonatal mortality attributable to their high-risk obstetrics telemedicine program. Telemedicine plays an important role in chronic disease management. The VA's care coordination and home telehealth program has resulted in a 19% reduction in readmission to the hospitals and 25% reduction in hospital days. Each telehealth application relies on broadband communication services that meet the need of the specific clinical service required. Surgical mentoring requires high definition and higher bandwidth, as do the transfer of large medical image files and video teleconferencing. Remote monitoring and home telehealth require less bandwidth. Regardless of the clinical application, affordable, reliable, secure quality of service is imperative. The rural health care program has been critical to telehealth networks nationwide. However, statutory and regulatory barriers have severely undermined the program's effectiveness. As of June 30, 2009, USAC reports a total disbursement over 12 years, total, of only $249 million, which is only 5% of the originally authorized amount. For the rural health care program to su succeed as intended, a number of areas need to be corrected that have been addressed in your draft bill. Statutory barriers limit the eligible consult origination sites, excluding such important entities as nursing homes, EMS providers, and even for-profit rural hospitals. For purposes of emergency preparedness or for access to emergency care, there is no question that rural for-profit hospitals serve the public interest. The program is bound by definitions of rural that fail to take into account our serious maldistribution of specialty health care providers. An expansion of the rural definition would align universal service support with these specialty workforce shortages. Other administrative barriers, including allowing only 25% support for Internet services, counterintuitive in an era where most telehealth programs deploy IP-based technologies. All communications providers should be eligible to participate in the program. In 2007, the FCC launched the Rural Health Care Pilot Program, recognizing 69 entities, including UVA, as eligible to receive more than $400 million in funds to expand the communications infrastructure for health care. As of June 30th, beginning the third year of the program, less than $1 million had been dispersed. This program, albeit well-intended, is equally fraught with significant barriers. Eligible providers are restricted, no funds are available for project management, and yet we as applicants are asked to provide letters of agency from each remote site, secure 15% in cash as matching funds, provide detailed quarterly reporting, even in the absence of funding, and sign five-year contracts for service for purposes of sustainability. These obstacles have hindered the program. Telehealth services both drive demand for broadband adoption and increase access to acute care and chronic disease management, 
through networks that include hospitals, clinics, physician offices, nursing homes, ambulances, the workplace, and the home. Broadband provided over wireline, wireless, cable, satellite, power lines, and other emerging technologies provide the communications infrastructure that supports the transformation of health care delivery. As you have addressed in this bill, our universal service programs must be modernized with a closer alignment with our health care needs so that one major value proposition of our investment in universal service can be achieved. That is an improvement in the health of all Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruban. Mr. Boston. Good morning. Uh, thank you. My boss has always told me that in order to do, to do a good job, you should pick your predecessor. Un unfortunately, I have failed in that today, but I'm going to go ahead with my testimony anyway. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member, member Stearns, and members of the sub subcommittee with special recognition for my representative, Congressman Eshoo, for the opportunity to appear before you here on this very important matter. Before I start, I want to recognize my colleague Brad Wimmer of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for his work on this testimony and our research over the past decade on universal service. I serve, yeah, excuse me, I serve now as Deputy Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and have studied universal service for more than 10 years. We're pleased that you have put forth legislation to reform the current universal service program. As with any program, it is important to implement universal service in as efficient a manner as possible. The current discussion draft includes some provisions that likely increase the efficiency of the Universal Service Program, but changes are possible that could decrease the cost substantially without sacrificing coverage or quality. The committee should implement legislation that makes revenue raising as efficient as possible and harnesses the power of the market to drive down subsidies and increase competition for consumers. First, I'll address the revenue side. The charges to raise money for Universal Service distort customer behavior and can be very costly. The best way to minimize these distortions are to have a low tax rate, which can be achieved by keeping the size of the program relatively small and then deriving the revenues from a broad base. It's good that the proposed legislation broadens the funding base. That should re reduce distortion if the lower tax rates do not in induce increased spending. Using general tax revenues would be a better way to fund universal service. While such an approach may not be politically feasible at this point in time, it should be considered. The discussion draft has several provisions, declaring broadband to be a universal service, using wire center averaging, the primary line rule, and eliminating the so-called parent trap that have the potential to increase the size of the universal service fund. And some draft pr provisions have the potential to compound harm by decreasing efficiency without any offsetting benefits. So first, I now I want to move on to service provision. The primary reason that a household does not subscribe to the connect to the communication network is because the household is not willing or able to pay as much for telecommunication services as the price charged. The Lifeline and LinkUp programs provide subsidies to low-income households in an, in an attempt to increase subscription rates among poor households. Representative Matsui has introduced a bill that would extend the Lifeline and LinkUp programs to cover broadband service. We think that such a program has the potential to increase broadband subscription rates among low-income populations, although more study is needed before any firm conclusions can be drawn. The results of our recent research indicate that moving money from the Lifeline program to the LinkUp side has the potential to increase the penetration rate without increasing the program size because LinkUp is targeted to households not connected and because low-income households face high barriers to upfront costs to getting connected. The High Cost Fund subsidizes the companies that provide services in high-cost areas. The majority of these subsidies are given to the incumbent local exchange carriers, or ILEX. And the discussion draft includes several proposals that appear to insulate the ILEX from competition for subsidies, which in turn insulates them from competition. It would be best to distribute subsidies to rural, rural customers themselves, not to the companies that serve them. Extending a program like Lifeline would cost and income-based vouchers to rural customers and urban customers could accomplish this goal, as Mr. Doyle discussed. Every dollar in the USF program comes from someone else's pocket, so it's important to be careful on how this is spent. The Rural High Cost Fund has increased substantially over the past several years, but one cause of this, competition, provides an indication that the current system is broken and that there is room to reduce instead of increase subsidies. Competition should drive down subsidies, not increase them. The discussion draft has a plan to use subsidy auctions, but only in very limited circumstances and not for all providers. Instead, subsidy auctions should be used pervasively. There should be subsidy auctions when there are two or more providers of any type, and all providers should participate in a subsidy auction. Such, such expansion of the subsidy auction plan could help drive down subsidy payments substantially, 
while at the same time protecting consumers. The most important feature of the subsidy auctions is that the incumbent local exchange providers would be subject to competitive discipline in the amount of subsidy that they receive for, for providing service. If it truly costs a lot of money to serve households in rural areas, companies serving the consumers in those high cost areas will end up with relatively high subsidy payments through the auction system. But if there are ways to serve the customers more efficiently, as Mr. McSlero has stated, the auction system will reveal it. The current system and the system in the current draft do not have these critical features. There is little incentive to reduce cost or the overall size of the universal service fund. Obviously, the design of subsidy auctions needs to be considered carefully, but the experience with subsidy auctions in other countries and the success with spectrum auctions in the United States shows that we can implement such a system in a pro-competitive manner. The major concern we have overall is that there not only be mechanisms to reduce the growth of the fund, but there also be mechanisms to make the fund as small as possible while still satisfying the goal of connectivity. We think that the current bill makes a very good move to broadening the base of support to minimize dis distortion and arbitrage incentives. We also think that it could be improved substantially if it were to set up a framework to allow competition to reduce the size of the subsidies, because that would be in the interest of all consumers. More detail is in our written testimony. Thank you for having me here today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rostin. And uh, our thanks to all of our witnesses for their very thoughtful comments here this morning, and particularly for the broad consensus and support of the draft legislation that, uh, that you have expressed today. I'm going to direct several questions to our rural representatives, Ms. Moyer and Mr. Greer, and I'm going to begin by referencing the recommendations made by Mr. McSlero, uh, where he says that the principles of competitive neutrality may be violated where you have wireline voice competition with one wireline carrier receiving support and competing with a wireline carrier that does not. Uh, on its face, I, I think his argument has merit. And I'm wondering what your response to that is. And if we were to uh, consider a provision that would prohibit support being provided in those instances where you have actual voice competition by wireline, uh, limiting the unavailability of support just to the precise areas where the competition actually exists. What would be your response to that? Now, I realize it may be a question of first impression, and if you don't have a definitive answer today, uh, that's certainly acceptable, but I wanted to pose that to you and get your thoughts at least for, uh, for the record this morning. Uh, Mr. Greer. Uh, yes, uh, Chairman Boucher. Uh, on the surface, we, we do have some concerns with the competitive bidding between the two because how are you going to... Well, it wouldn't necessarily, let me just interrupt to say, be a competitive bidding. I, I think his proposal doesn't actually relate to competitive bidding. It relates to simply saying that support would not be available where you have a carrier uh, that is offering voice service without support. In theory, where you have a carrier that's offering the service in that particular study area without support, uh, it suggests that support is not necessary in order to sustain a service. So he's, he's suggesting that you not have competitive bidding. You just deny the support under that circumstance. Mr. Greer. I would like to think on that for just a moment real quick. All right, that's fine. Ms. Moyer. Well, I guess I'd like to point out that um, one of the problems with our service area with 5,000 square miles is that roughly only 15 of those square miles would be what I'd consider town. Within those 15 square miles, we, there is a cable company that serves. It actually um, belongs to us because no one else wanted to come in and provide cable service. Um, but the problem being that within that 15 square miles, the majority, like over 90% of our population is going to reside in those areas. So when we get outside of those areas, we're talking about very few customers and a very large service area that would need to be served. Thus, you're talking about dollars that are going to be exponentially related to those very few customers. Um, right. Obviously, I have read NCTA's uh, uh, proposal here just last week. Um, but we would be more than happy to, to submit something further to you on the record in writing. 
Well, let me encourage you to think about it and to uh, engage with us on, on that subject. I, I think a number of members are going to have those interests. Uh, Mr. Greer, would you like to respond further? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Boucher. Uh, in those areas to where there is wireless and wireline competition, when we look at our USF and how we average our cost, we average it over our whole service area. So if, if you just eliminated a portion of that, then our cost in those other areas that are unaveraged will actually go up. And that's one of the concerns we would have is they may serve a portion of our service area, but it doesn't do a complete coverage, and so it, it will actually drive up our cost because we average that throughout our service territory, but we also want to get back to you with further comments. All right, that, that's fine. Thank, well, thank both of you for that. I frankly would have been somewhat surprised if you had just uh, immediately agreed with the entire recommendation. Um, let me pose another question to you. Some have suggested that the high cost fund, approximately $4.5 billion per year, be repurposed in whole or in part in order to provide broadband services. And my understanding is that that $4.5 billion each year is spoken for. That funding is presently fully subscribed in order for you to offer the telephone services that you're offering. Uh, that money is uh, subscribed for equipment, for maintenance, for your normal operations. And uh, my question to you is what response do you have to the idea that some repurposing could take place with money devoted today to those needs being devoted tomorrow to broadband? What would happen in your exchanges if that were to occur? Ms. Moyer? One of the issues is that two-year lag. The two years in between when we actually put money in the ground and two years later we actually receive the support or the cost recovery for those dollars that we have already spent. So part of that problem going forward is the issue of what happens to what I spent in 2009 if in 2010 the entire fund is repurposed. Um, there are ongoing maintenance costs that are always going to be there. Um, we, my companies in southwest Kansas, were several hundred miles from any major metropolitan area. That transport to any major metropolitan area is huge, not just to mention, you know, just meeting up with carriers at tandems. So those costs those dollars have already, have already been spent. And then to recover those, there needs to be, if in fact we're going to repurpose the fund, there needs to be some attention paid to that fact of the two-year lag. All right, very quickly, uh, Mr. Greer. We concur with those uh, comments as well. And currently, the costs that we spend, we're not reimbursed till two years down the road anyway. So you, so you do agree that those monies are fully subscribed? They are fully subscribed. And there's nothing available, really, to support broadband deployment within the size of the existing fund without uh, surrendering the low cost, uh, the uh, affordable telephone service that you presently provide. That is correct. Okay, thank you very much. My time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lubin, um, Vice President of Public Policy, AT&T Services, um, you're probably the good one to answer this. And I have limited time, so if you could just answer uh, in a very small amount of time by the word increase or decrease is the key terms to use. Could you estimate whether each of the following provisions is more likely to increase or decrease the size of the fund? Or if it's unclear to you, uh, could you please tell us what additional information you would uh, need to provide a cost estimate? And the first one is moving from a geographic to wire center averaging. Does it increase or decrease the fund? That is moving from geographic to wire center averaging. Um, the, the just your humble opinion. And just move the mic close to you, if you could. Um, it, it sounds like a simple question, but I'll give you a simple answer. Just uh, does it increase or decrease? As, uh, my, my guess is it, it's going to increase. However, it's a function of what model you use. Um, and the current language in the bill says 2.75. Using that modeling, would it increase or decrease? When you say using that model. That's in the bill. It's not clear to me what, what model we're using in the bill. Okay. Okay, it's not clear to you. Okay, that's a good point. I mean, that goes to the idea that you need additional information before you could say increase or decrease. But at this point, you're saying it, your first hand blush is it increases. That okay. particular piece. Okay. 
The next one is eliminating the parent trap rule. I had that explained to me. I wasn't sure what that is, but now I do. And I, I think you know what the parent trap rule is. So would it increase or decrease the fund, eliminating the parent trap rule? Uh, the potential is it would increase. Okay. It's a function of how many exchanges <clears throat> and lines get sold. Okay. Creating an alternative recovery mechanism for intercarrier compensation revenues. Let me repeat that. Creating an alternative recovery mechanism for intercarrier compensation revenues. Will it increase the size of the fund or decrease it, in your opinion? Uh, that has the potential for increasing. Again, it's a function, function of okay. how and what the benchmarking Okay, so happens. in this question, I've given you three uh, areas, and it looks like to me in all three areas you said it would increase. I said the potential is there. Potential, okay. Um, let me have uh, Verizon. Uh, do they have any uh, disagreement on this? Well, uh, no, no disagreement on that, um, uh, Representative Stearns. I, okay. I, I think uh, you're probably getting to the second half of the question, which is uh, are there other aspects of the legislation that, that could potentially decrease the size of the fund as well? I'd be happy to respond. Well, I'm happy with the decrease. I'm just, try I'm just concentrating this morning on what areas that I think might increase, and just so we have an understanding where the worst-case scenario would be. Uh, Mr. Rostin, is there anything that you might want to comment on this uh, relative to uh, Mr. Lubin's um, answers? Uh, no, I, I agree that I think those all three provisions would increase, that have, are likely to increase the size of the like, fund. Likely increase. Uh, Mr. Lubin has indicated, though, he in some cases he'd need additional information to provide a real cost estimate. Uh, do you think you can emphatically say more so than he? He sort of has some uh, qualifying points here. Do you feel pretty much that all three of them will increase in your mind? I, I'm, I'm pretty clear. Mr. Lubin has studied this in much, much more detail than I have, but, for example, the parent trap would have almost no chance of decreasing the fund, and any sales would probably increase the size of the fund, as one example. The same would be true of intercarrier compensation. Okay. Uh, um, let me go to Mr. Mesclero. Um, you recommended targeting support for broadband services to areas and consumers that currently lack service. I guess the first question is, do we know uh, those areas and consumers are today? Uh, do we know where they, where they are? I think by and large, we do. We um, do. And so I think we do have the ability to target support where it's most needed. Um, shouldn't we wait on the results of the $7.2 billion broadband stimulus and the broadband mapping efforts that are currently underway before paying companies even more to provide brand broadband service in areas that may al they may already have it? I think the answer is yes, but I think it's going to happen. I mean, the timeline here, we're already in November of 2009. The mapping will get done next year in any plausible scenario where this legislation moves. I think it'll match up so that we'll have that data. So in your opinion, we shouldn't wait? No, I'm not suggesting we wait. What I'm suggesting is the mapping, I think, will get done before the bill passes. Yes. Okay, that's true. Dr. Rostin, isn't it true that a tax on broadband could decrease broadband s subscription and inhibit adoption? Yes, that, that uh, increasing taxes on broadband to pay for, as I said earlier, the, every dollar you spend comes from someone else's pocket, so that would increase the price for other people, and they would possibly respond by reducing their subscriptions. Okay. Ms. Moyer, do you think in your heart of hearts that the bill is drafted right now uh, would lower consumers' bill? I mean, would you put your money on it? My own money? Your own money. <laughs> your own money. As opposed I, to what we do. <laughs> I, I truly believe that by expanding the contribution base, yes, it would. So in your heart of hearts, you'd put your own money on this then? I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay, well, you're in the, you have some skin in the game, so I respect your opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to uh, all the witnesses. Um, I've made a point in, um, in other hearings uh, and in my communications with the NTIA, the FCC, and RUS that high speed should be a primary uh, goal to, uh, uh, for broadband uh, rollout. Uh, I think that this legislation sets the floor 
uh, too low. It defines broadband as 1.5 uh, megabits downstream without any uh, uh, upstream requirement, and it locks in this speed for six very long years. And as I said in my opening statement, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's uh, uh, everything has changed and continues to change so quickly. Uh, six years is um, uh, is a very long time. People in rural America deserve, uh, I think, high-speed access as well. And I don't think we should lowball them um, as part of the overall uh, uh, reform efforts. Uh, I think we need to keep in mind that we have no idea what will be happening in six years. Telecommunications develop so quickly that this speed might be considered a relic by then. Uh, so why lock this in for six years? Uh, in the broadband uh, bill that I had uh, put forward, we uh, set forth a 50 megabit uh, down and 20 up requirement, which I believed would drive investment and spur adoption. But who knows? That might even be uh, too slow. So I think we need to use the broadband map to determine which speeds are appropriate for a given market. So my question to, the, uh, to you, the panelists, is uh, how can we use the broadband map to help guide our policy, especially on determining uh, the appropriate speed? Do we really need one speed for the whole country? And I'm also concerned about uh, the bill essentially maintaining the status quo for the high cost fund. Um, Recipients of the fund are not required to provide broadband services, which I think is a huge mistake. I mean, I, I think that we're ignoring our future. Um, I think we're ignoring the present, much less <laughs> the future. So I, I think that there's a big hole in the bill in this area. And, and so my second question is, shouldn't the bill require the FCC to utilize the new broadband map to determine if an area is already served by a provider that may not receive any, uh, uh, um, you know, fund support. Is there any sense how much could be saved if we first determined which areas? And I think Mr. McSlarrow uh, spoke to this, and maybe some others did as well. Uh, is there any sense how much could be saved if we first determined which areas are already served by a provider offering voice, video, and data today and not receiving any government support? Um, and lastly, if there's anyone that would like to comment on, uh, on uh, uh, Ms. Matsui's bill, uh, which will use the Lifeline program as uh, based for uh, broadband accessibility for the unserved and the underserved population. So those are my three questions, and uh, whomever would like to uh, start the ball rolling. Good. at and first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. To me, those are three very important can questions. Can you use the, get closer to the microphone so uh, we can hear you? Yes. Thanks. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, three very important questions. The, the, the first question about speed, um, and I, I want to link that question with Just be, uh, can you be as concise as possible since I asked three and I want to okay. get as many answers in okay. as possible. Thanks. Um, the issue of speed is all about how much are, are we willing to pay into the fund, meaning how big is the fund. The, the higher the speed, more the size of the fund will be. So that is a trade-off for the policy makers if you want it to end up being 10 or 20. But, what, but what's AT&T's position in this, though? AT&T's position with regard to speed, um, with regard to USF, is if you take USF, then you have to meet whatever speed requirement is in the bill, and you're going to ultimately be a form of making a commitment to provide all com comers with that speed. And so our concern with going one dot, even 1.5 megabit potentially is too high when you start looking at what the size of the fund would be. So that, that's our concern with regard to the first question. With regard to the second question on um, unserved areas in terms of the mapping, we think that's a very important issue to be addressed. And AT&T, April 18, 2008, made a filing teeing up this point where we should focus on unserved areas, thus possibly being able to control the size of the fund. So having focused on unserved is a very important aspect. But I would like to highlight to you is once you do that, in particular for the RLEX, if you still start looking at the very high cost areas, the presumption is you may reduce the size of the fund. Uh, I think Ms. Moyer hit, hit the right on the head is that once you do that, you may in fact start to uh, increase the size of the fund. Uh, with regard to Lifeline, 
we think as we transition from th this POTS world to a broadband world, we think a lifeline is going to be absolutely critical in a broadband world. Our bottom line with regard to lifeline is we think the whole lifeline plan. How long do you think it's going to take to get us to what you're describing, though? You think we should set this down, the lowest numbers, for six years, six long years? Um, that's good policy for the country? Um, again, it's a question back to how much are you willing to fund? How big will it cause the fund? I, I've already heard issues about what the concern of the growth of the fund will be. Mm -hmm. I think if you make it much greater than 1.5, that question's on the table. I, if you want to suggest less than six years, I think that's, that's a valid thing to say, let's l mm -hmm. look at it shorter than six years. But listening to this conversation, clearly the higher it is, the bigger the size of the fund. That's, that's the linkage in the issue. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo and uh, Mr. Lubin. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was watching the hearing on the, uh, in my office, so I, I heard everyone's testimony, and I heard your questions and Ms. Stern's questions. So I haven't been, haven't been present, but I have been observant while I've been multitasking. I brought my bill. I just got my Verizon bill. And um, for services, I paid $26.53 for taxes. Actually, it says taxes, fees, and other Verizon charges, whatever that is, $10.49. So I'm paying 40% of my basic phone service in Virginia is taxes, fees, and other Verizon charges. Seems like, a, although I did find out that the <laughs> universal service portion of this is fairly minimal because I don't make any long distance charges. So although Virginia does charge me a, a, a Virginia Federal Universal Service Fund surcharge, Mr. Boucher, of 76 cents, and I hope you can do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted to ask a trick question, I'd ask Mr. Davidson what a sensible minute is. Verizon charges me $2 a month for a sensible minute. I have no clue what a sensible minute is. <laughs> I guess so. We'll, anyway. have get, we'll have to get back to that, yeah. Mr. Barton, on the, on the, sen the sensible minute. But I, I, my, my, I doubt my, it was our idea. Yeah, my first, my first question is a rhetorical question that anybody on the panel can answer. Um, when did we first pass universal service? When did it become a mandate that there be a universal service charge? Anybody know? I would assume in the 1930s. Does anybody on the dais know? And I don't w know. Would the gentleman yield just yeah. for a moment? Uh, universal service has been inherent in the structure of the telephone network essentially since its inception. And it wasn't until the Telecom Act of 96 that we made the universal service subsidies explicit. Uh, well, when did we first start charging universal service? Well, that's been inherent in, in the structure of, of the flow of revenues uh, er, er, essentially ever since uh, we began. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't a federal mandate. In it, it was not a mandate. It, it was just done within the industry where urban residents and, and users of long distance wound up paying somewhat more in order to keep telephone service affordable elsewhere. Okay. Well, my first question, I'm going to ask this um, to the gentleman from Stanford, uh, Dr. Roston. Is broadband today the equivalent of basic telephone service in the 30s? I think uh, that's not uh, an, an economics question that I would answer as an economist. Uh, it, is, it is probably much, if you look at the data, broadband is much more pervasively adopted today than telephone service was in the 1930s. Whether you're asking that as a values question, I can't answer that, but just sort of the data shows that broadband has been adopted much more rapidly than telephone service was, and it's much more pervasive than it was in the 1930s. Well, the reason I ask that is because one of the apparent premises of the Boucher-Terry draft is that broadband should be equivalent to basic phone service 
that it is almost an entitlement and should be treated as such. And I'm not quite ready to go there yet. I think broadband is an improvement. I think it's an enhancement. I think it's a good thing to have. But if I choose to live in, in very rural America by choice, I like that lifestyle, I don't know that I, one of the witnesses from one of the uh, smaller phone companies basically said people that live in rural America expect to have the same services, la di da di da as people that live in urban America. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, I, I think you make a value decision where you, if you have a choice of where you live, if you choose that rural lifestyle, I don't know that you automatically are entitled to the... Uh, the enhancements that are that require more critical mass and a greater population density. So that's one of the things I want to work with Mr. Uh, Boucher and Mr. Terry on is this 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 broadband mandate. Um, my time's expired. I'm going to ask one question to Mr. McSlaro. Does does the cable industry currently pay a universal service charge? Yes, you do. Um, do you support the concept in the in the Boucher Terry draft? that expands the base of who pays the tax? Yes. You do? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's not the answer I wanted, but thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. It, it's the answer that I'm glad he gave. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Barton. The uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rostin, in, in your testimony, you said you believed that Subsidies, uh, subsidies should follow consumers, not companies, to increase competition and choice. Um, do you think, uh, is a reverse auction the only way to accomplish that, or could a voucher work, and are there any other ways as well, and, and what are some of the pros and cons of those approaches? So uh, what, what I thought, it, what I said in the testimony is, if you had a voucher system that went, that was sort of, my, my view would be, low-income vouchers that were cost-adjusted so that a low-income household in a dense urban area would get a smaller voucher because the company would be charging a lower price in that area and a higher voucher in a rural area so that they could afford it in a rural area. You could do that and the voucher would go with, uh, be income tested and cost tested, sort of like uh, healthcare vouchers might be adjusted for people's age and health conditions that you would have a, a voucher for telephone service or broadband service. And that could, that could be done without an auction and it would, it would cause the consumers to have the ability to choose their provider and the providers would have to compete with it, compete for the service, whether they wanted 1.5 megabit service or five megabit or 10 megabit or portable service uh, so that they could use it on their wireless phone as opposed to at their home, they would have this ability to have, have companies compete for their business. Thank you. M Mr. McSlara, what, what, what do you think about that, those ideas? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. I, what do you think about the idea of a, of, of a voucher system or? I think, I, I mean, I, in economic terms, I agree, with, I, I agree with that. And I think any system where we can put more money in the hands of the consumers of themselves and let them make the cho choices is probably a better system. And, and I also want to give you the opportunity, I know that uh, several of the uh, testimony from uh, the phone companies talked about some of the concerns they had with your proposal uh, and, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe uh, address some of those concerns that were brought up about uh, your proposal. Thank you. Um, the first thing I would say is that what we're proposing is in essence a framework. There's no automatic reduction of high cost support. What we're saying is that you, you, you apply two tests. One's a regulatory test, one's a market competition test if it shows that you have that kind of competition, it still allows the incumbent who's receiving support to come forward and say, here are all the reasons why if you took out support in the competitive area, my revenues can't cover my costs. So they still have an opportunity to make a showing um, for, for some level of support. And Ms. Eshoo actually asked the question I didn't get a chance to answer you. Our analysis is that there is about $2 billion that we would at least, under our proposal, take a look at. We're not saying $2 billion goes away. People have the opportunity to make those showings back and forth. Very good. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll yield back.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Doyle. Um, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Lubin. Let's continue this exercise. Uh, assume the cap is put in place. Will the fund go up or down? Thank you for your answer. Uh, and uh, Cliff did a great job of kind of hitting on what the main issue here is here. We understand that with some of these reforms that the cost will have additional pressures. The pressures from those items that were brought up other than ICC, which I think is a different issue than what this base bill addresses today, uh, would make the fund increase. The reason why our rural friends have had a difficult time uh, embracing this bill is because of the cap. And I think that's an important point to make here is with the cap, uh, that keeps it status quo, albeit with an FCC traditional inflation rate. Um, so with the cap, uh, do you think uh, that that's an adequate measure to hold down the explosive uh, costs of the of high cost USF. Mike, you need your mic on. Oh, sorry. With the way you w in which this bill structures the cap and the way in which you just remove three of the items, I, I, I would say yes. Okay. Um, uh, I, I would also highlight that how you handled the wireless issue with yes. the competitive bidding there you have the opportunity that the aggregate dollars would come down. And I, that was my next question. Thank you. Just eliminate that for me. Appreciate that. But, yeah, that, there are actually cost-cutting measures in here. Um, for example, limiting new entrants, uh, especially on the wireless side, and we appreciate Verizon and the others helping uh, participate in brokering that deal. Um, Limiting new entrants going to actual costs. Is that something that would relieve pressure on uh, the upward pressures on the fund? Uh, that, that, that remains to be seen. Okay. Um, uh, gentleman from Stanford. Doctor, what was your last name again? Roston. Roston. Uh, economist. Based on your uh, experience um, as an economist, let me throw this scenario out. University of Nebraska beats Kansas State. <laughs> we go to the Holiday Bowl and play Stanford. Who wins? <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, good answer. Uh, but getting to a more serious question, you brought up the distortion, and that is at, uh, in the pool that as the pool of payors grows smaller, and we've heard testimony here, uh, since the pay, uh, those that uh, pay the universal service fee into the system, uh, they just get billed every, what, six months or something by USAC. And now it's, uh, it could go as high as 14 to 15 percent. Just, I mean, that's something that was unfathomable a year or so ago. Uh, so broadening the pool of uh, users, I mean, of payors, is one of the founding principles of this bill. So at least that principle you think economically is sound. Yes, I think broadening the base of the tax will uh, help to reduce distortions from a tax. And the distortions here have been, uh, I think, well set out by the ranking member, uh, former Chairman Barton, when he talks about the impact on his bill, although the USF uh, impact is hidden within the charges, and it's not explicit. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he is one of those left standing paying, and if you broaden the base, his bill could actually go down. Well, I think that depends on how many bills he has. And well, and also assuming the cap is in place. Well, the, the, the cap is, I think it's, uh, it, it could be, it's a question of how effective the cap is at reigning and spending as well, because there are, uh, provisions about whether the cap would be effective, I think, about it adjusts for working loops in, in, and as well as inflation. All right. I think those things could be tightened down a little bit as well. Well, we and can work that. I'm going to interrupt because I only have a few seconds left. And Ms. Moyer, Ms. Moyer, Mrs. Uh, one of the items that I think will help control the costs is having professional, skilled 
audits done? Do you support that and give us examples of how the audit process works today? Yes, we fully support that. Um, today's audit procedure, especially with the FCC's OIG office, the most recent three rounds of audits have unfortunately been performed by auditors who uh, don't know much about telecom bookkeeping and finances and uh, I think led to some erroneous results, many of which USAC has refuted since then. But to actually do something um, that's based on FCC methodology and uh, with some trained auditors would be welcomed. Thank you very much, Mr. Terry. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I mentioned before in my opening statement, there have been several recent reports that strongly suggest that adoption rates are largely associated with income. I'd like to highlight one study that particularly affects my home state of California. According to the Public Policy Institute of California, only 58% of Californians earning under $40,000 a year subscribe to broadband at home. But in contrast, 97% of those earning over $80,000 or more a year subscribe. I'd like to um, ask a question of um, Mr. Rostam, the Californian there. Uh, it's my understanding that you have conducted extensive research on the USF Lifeline Link-Up program. As you know, the price of broadband is not cheap these days, usually ranging from $40 to $60 a month. In your studies, is there strong evidence to suggest that the price of broadband is a determining subscribership factor in many low-income Americans in urban and rural areas? So uh, my, my research is focused on lifeline and link-up for telephone service and not necessarily for broadband, but it would be uh, sacrilegious as an economist not to say that price matters. Uh, for, for low income households, uh, I think we should study this and make sure that any program we have, we can figure out what is the impact of price on uh, low income households. The evidence in our research is that there are two programs, Lifeline and Link Up, and our, our view, uh, we found in our research, we didn't go into this thinking about it, but that Link Up turned out to be much more effective because of the high cost of, for telephone service, just paying the connection fee. For broadband service, you need to not only pay the connection fee, but you also need to have a computer and knowledge of uh, how it might work and how it might benefit you. So link up targeting those who are not already online is probably a very effective way of doing this. So you believe that if you had a program similar to the link up program that if it created for the universal broadband, that uh, there would be an effective vehicle to expand, uh, increase broadband adoption rates? Yes, I think a Lifeline and Link-Up program would increase broadband adoption rates. Okay, and your analysis of the current Lifeline Link-Up program, would it be accurate to assume that any expansion of the program for broadband adoption would be just as beneficial for rural consumers as it would be for urban consumers? Uh, yes, I think so. I think that uh, poor people live both in urban and rural areas, and so Lifeline and Link-Up would be uh, beneficial in both areas. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Ms. Moyer and Mr. Rhoda. Um, Ms. Moyer, I'd like to begin with you. It's well noted that one of the barriers to further broadband deployment in rural areas is getting more households to subscribe to broadband. In your view, would a program for broadband adoption similar to the current Lifeline program help increase adoption rates in the communities in which you serve and other rural areas across the country, and would it help further the goal of broadband deployment in current unserved rural areas? Yes, I do agree, and I believe that your legislation would push, would spur that adoption okay. as well as education. Thank you, and Mr. Rhoda, could you briefly address the same question? Uh, we agree as well. As uh, far back as 2006, we talked to the FCC about adoption programs. We've been in recently to do the same, and I think they need to cover the costs of the of the device, the, the laptop, the computer. I think that they need to cover education. Some people just clearly don't understand the benefits that broadband will bring to them, and then they also finally need to cover the costs for those that can't handle it of the monthly service in some respect. So we're fully supportive of your efforts. Okay, thank you. And I have a question for Mr. Baum. Deployment of broadband has reached 96%, but subscribership rates have lagged far beyond, be, behind in both urban and rural areas. Do you believe Lifeline for broadband would improve subscribership rates and at what, sh what price point do you believe or do you think would be reasonably affordable? First of all, first of all the uh, Nehru Board of Directors passed today a resolution supporting your uh, Lifeline oh, bill. Thank you. 
And we think it's difficult to put the benchmark out there, but I would take a wild guess it'd be, you know, twenty five, twenty dollars, something in that neighborhood. Twenty five, twenty dollars. But I would I would probably defer to my colleagues in the industry that actually run the models and do this kind of thing. Does someone else make a, have a comment on that? But uh yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um I was actually thinking maybe in the thirty dollar range or so, so it's probably quite close to what you're thinking and um so that really sounds like a maybe a fifteen or ten to fifteen dollar per month subsidy, which is probably what which is in line with the reimbursement under the current lifeline program. Would you consider that to be about right? If we had broadband as a supported service, the benchmark for that service would be in the thirty dollar heading towards forty dollars in the future because that's simply the basic cost out there for that one point five megabit service is in that range. Okay. Thank you very much and I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Matsui. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you all for your patience and your indulgence. I know you've been here for quite a while. I got just a couple of questions that I, I want to add, um, ask. And let me start, Mr. Davidson, with you. And let's just go down if you all have something to add on this. If you could change one part of this bill, if you think we're getting it wrong in one area, if you wanted to change one section of this, what would you change and why? And quickly, if we'll start with you, sir. Sure. Um, I, I think uh, I, I think probably the the first thing that we would look at is, uh, and this is actually a suggestion that's in the bill, but it is not made um, uh, is not uh, directed in the bill, and that would be going to the numbers um, contribution formulation. I think that's the most efficient way in the modern uh, in the modern world of the various uh, means. Okay, of, so uh, let me interrupt you right there. The contribution formulation, uh, just to give some specifics on that, to define it. Sure. Um, okay. So today, you know, we, we as I mentioned in my testimony. No, I mean in the language. You're just saying. Oh provide well, we we'll just definition. specify in the language yes. that the FCC should follow the uh, numbers-based okay. approach for um, for contributions. Great, Mr. Greer. We have, we have concerns with the cap, but we look forward to working with the FCC in, on the national broadband plan when it comes out next year. Okay, great. So, uh, From Windstream's perspective, it would be uh, driving uh, efficient costs across the board. Some of the mechanisms in today's environment don't necessarily force carriers to be efficient and yet still get reimbursement. There's a number of measurements in this bill that do drive efficiency, but it's not across the board. Thank you. Um, I, I would highlight the issue of uh, speed, um, concerned about the level of speed, n not that it's too high, uh, um, I'm sorry, that, that it potentially is too high, and the issue of concern is if you can, and now I'm focused on rural areas, I'm focused on if, if there's an alternative technology that can get it out there in a cost-effective way, um, and that is a way to control the size of the, uh, of the aggregate fund. Excellent. Ms. Morger? The rural ILACs have uh, concerns with the cap language. Okay. Well, NARUC has concerns about the preemption language, but on a personal basis, I think the, the speed needs to be realistic as to what we really need in the, econ in the economy. And we have to also acknowledge that there are a lot of uh, rural constituencies that produce the food and fiber for the country that need access mm -hmm. to this kind of bad broadband technology, and it's not a choice for them to live there. It's how we feed ourselves, and their hospitals and schools have to have that same, same um, access to broadband. Since I've already talked about my proposal and Peter talked about numbers, I'm going to cheat and add a third, which is uh, ensuring that if we are going to have uh, support going to, for broadband, that it be restricted to truly unserved America. <laughs> Thank you for your kind comments earlier. Uh, appreciate that. RCA would um, change the reverse auction provision. It's simply not a silver bullet for USF reform. Reverse auctions encourage a race to the bottom. They do not uh, sh uh, guarantee a reduction in cost, and they discourage new entrants. However, if we move forward with reverse auctions, they absolutely should apply to everyone participating in the USF fund and not only 
wireless providers. If wireless providers are subject to it as part of a greenfield build, surely wireline providers who have depreciated plant in the ground over a number of years could compete as well. For purposes of telemedicine, we're very supportive of the bill and its current status. The one thing we might add is to ensure upstream bandwidth as well because for telemedicine, we're trying to get feedback from the patient um, or from the hospital, so it should be bidirectional. Uh, so I, I would uh, change the whole system to be vouchers to low-income households, but given that that's not going to change in this bill, I would say extend auctions, set a time limit for the FCC to imp and put them in in the next 6 to 12 months and go ahead. They're not a silver bullet, but they're better than the current system. Thank you very much, and I've got 23 seconds left. Mr. McSlayer, I will come back to you and not take the committee's time right now. And, but I wanted, I think we need to look at how quickly we're moving to an IP world and uh, VoIP as a primary technology. And as we looked at the reauthorization of the 96 Telecom Act, one of the things we heard from all of you was, well, the bill is arcane, the bill has outlived its usefulness, technology changes so fast. And I think that one of the things that we need to look at is what we can do to ensure that the universal service mechanisms work in a changing environment, in a VoIP environment, and making certain that this bill is going to work in an IP world. And I know I'm out of time, but I will, um, would appreciate your response to that question in writing as we move forward or at a later date. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blackburn. The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll direct my first question, not surprisingly, to Dr. Ruban. Um, but I want to thank you for some of the recommendations that you've made, um, realizing how much we're relying on tel uh, telemedicine um, and health care reform and to improve outcomes and, and reduce costs. So I appreciate the... Um, recommendations that you made. The, um, the Reform Act, the USF Reform Act requires that universal fund recipients offer high speed broadband services with a download rate of at least one and one half megabytes per second. And you, in your testimony you spoke to different broadband needs for different services and um, I wanted to know if the speed that we're recommending of at least one and one half megabytes per second is adequate for what's required to support all of the services. I think for HD and surgical mentoring, it's not sufficient. I think it, it um, is sufficient for a clinic operation or for um, certainly for the home. Um, you know, home telehealth wouldn't require quite as much bandwidth as some of the more sophisticated applications. And if you have multiple users providing healthcare services in a hospital, you can imagine that the demand for the bandwidth would be significantly greater. So again, 1.54 is good for some applications, but not for others. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would ask this question to Mr. Baum and Mr. Rostin, but if anyone else wanted to um, jump in, be fine. Um, Section 104 on eligible recipients of universal service support exempts existing recipients of the USF funds, primarily rural telcos, from the requirement to deploy and provide high-speed broadband service for five years. The FCC may also grant a three-year waiver of this provision if the provider demonstrates that it's not technically feasible or would materially impair its ability to continue to provide local exchange service. That re waiver is renewable for every three years. Um, Ubiquitous, ubiquitous broadband deployment is a primary goal of the administration and this Congress, this committee. Currently, the FCC is working on a new national broadband plan. Even the discussion draft requires new providers who are eligible to receive U.S. support to deploy high-speed bro broadband service and provide high-speed broadband service and provide it. So why then should we... Um, exempt existing recipients of USF. Do you agree with that exemption or waiver? What that refers to is the fact that some of these areas are so remote and so expensive to serve that, that, that we really probably need to have a satellite option there. Uh, there'll be some really remote pockets of population and even single family dwellings that simply are too far out in the rural areas of America to be receiving broadband by fixed 
fixed basis. Mm -hmm. So either their service is either some kind of wireless broadband or in this instance, instance it would be satellite. We simply can't get everywhere in the country. We might get to 98 percent, we might get to 96 percent somewhere. And also remember that we never got phone service beyond about 95 percent of the population. Some people just don't want to hook up and some people are just too far out and it'll be too expensive to serve them and they, they'll have to do a satellite. Mr. Rossen, did you want to add anything? Or uh, no, I just really? the satellite yeah. option is an important safety valve in that it covers pretty much most everywhere that, and especially the high cost areas. So that would be a safety valve in this. Well, let me ask you, Mr. Ross, and, and um, one of your main points is that, uh, that you suggest that subsidies should go to consumers, not companies, to increase competition and choice. Could you uh, elaborate on that? It sounds very attractive. It sounds like it may be a major upheaval, though. Could you elaborate on that recommendation? Sure. It's uh, generally a way of giving consumers choice in what they want. If you decide that the best service for your house is a wireless service because you work outside a lot of the time and need to be uh, accessible, that you'd have the chance to use this, the subsidy to provide you service that gets you outside or around if you move around. If you're a plumber that has jobs and you need to look up stuff and you, need, you don't need 20 megabits a second to watch videos but you need to look up parts for your job, you'd be able to do that and use the different kinds of services that are tailored to what you want to do. So I think that this would then give consumers the choice to provide, to pick the service that best suits their needs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davison, um, you in your testimony said the problem is not spending uh, too little, but spending it in the wrong places. Um, how would you redistribute uh, the funds and does the bill adequately address this, that change? Yes, I think, thank you for the question. I think, I think that's right. I mean, the, the question is uh, finding out right now where the true needs of consumers are. And I, and I would also go back and, and focus uh, the panel on, on the needs of the consumer, too, which I think is a, it's been a great part of this hearing. We spent a lot of time talking about that. So, so the mechanisms that the uh, Boucher Terry Bill uses to figure out where the, where the services are needed and where they aren't, uh, I think, are very important. So the competitive bidding uh, portion, um, again, I mentioned the numbers formulation before, and um, so you think uh, we're adequately addressing that issue in, in the bill? I, I, th I think they are. Yes, I think that the I think the bill has many provisions in it that's trying to prioritize where the scarce resources should be directed. So there are many aspects of the bill that are that are directed uh, toward doing that. And there's been some other ideas raised on the panel here as well. Uh, Mr. McSlero's idea is interesting. Uh, and others as well. So I think those should be uh, e examined to make sure that we're prioritizing uh, the funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, Ms. Christensen. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for uh, their testimony today on this very important piece of legislation. I want to go to Mr. Baum. In Oregon, where uh, certain nationwide service providers are shedding their remaining rural lines, can you outline for us how the parent trap uh, may impact other carriers' decisions to step in to provide phone service uh, to the rural constituents I have. Well, the reality is, is that the regional bell operating companies have been unable to do an adequate job of deploying broadband in their high-cost rural areas. That's because they face competition in their urban areas and their business model just simply doesn't allow them to do that. The RLEX, uh, rural companies, in, ex in contrast, do receive better subsidies from the Universal Service Fund, which allows them to deploy broadband. So their broadband's out there about 92 percent. And depending on the company, the RBOX are anywhere from the low 70s to the high 80s. They just don't have a business model that works. So the parent trap would allow some of the mid-sized and small companies to come into those areas and to refurbish them and get the subsidy that they would receive as RLEX to refurbish some of those areas and deploy broadband. It would be uh, important to have that dealt with in some way because really the failure to deploy broadband is in rural high cost areas is largely a regional bell operating company's issue and affects about 50 percent of the country and we simply have to address that issue and that's why it's important that we do something on that regard about the parent trap. It's also important that we focus some of this money if there is some on the unserved areas in those Arbach areas and that could be done by auction, it could be done by request for proposal, but we need to have infrastructure built out there so that those communities can have the same benefits that the communities have that are, that are served by the rural local exchange carriers. 
Let me switch gears since we're on the, the broadband build-out. And when the uh, stimulus bill was debated before this committee, there was a significant amount of money put forward to engage in broadband build-out. And we had rather extensive discussions here about the money getting out there before the mapping was completed and the debate over uh, underserved versus unserved. Now I understand they're compressing uh, the second and third wave of funding, and I just wonder from your position at NARUC and as a, a commissioner what you're seeing in terms of where this money is going, because it seems to me that with the taxpayer dollars involved or the USF dollars involved, it should go into areas that have no service to begin with if we're going to knit this country together in a broadband world. One of the problems of the current um, broadband stimulus package is some of the bigger companies have declined to apply because of some issues over net neutrality and not certain about what those strings mean to the deployment of dollars. So half of the country's areas, they don't have the major ILEC in that area even applying in the high cost areas. Now there are some other people that are applying it's kind of a, in a little bit of an overbuilt fashion. Uh, some of them are other areas. Uh, you know, we have a, for instance, in Oregon, Ben Cable is also applying to bail out broadband in an area that's served by Quest. And they're trying to go outside of town and serve unserved areas, but uh, unfortunately when you try to serve any area, you're going to serve the populated area as well, and so it's difficult to truly target an unserved area. So there'll be some improvements in the broadband stimulus. It will deploy some things in some unserved areas but we still have major players out there who aren't in the game. And, and Mr. Mescleros, uh, uh, Kyle's comment, uh, his suggestion about uh, a different way to look at, at the whole model. And, and Kyle, I believe, I believe you indicated that uh, it'd be in an area that 75% served would then be in a competitive? Yeah, the, um, we're proposing essentially two tests. One would be in, in a rural study area, say, where there is significant competition, which we're defining as 75 percent or more of the households can receive a competitive, unsubsidized service, or a situation where the state has actually deregulated prices on the theory that competition is present. So, so I guess my question would be, again, I have a district that's 75,000 square miles, so you could have the urban area, the extent we have them, in a very large geographic area and probably serve 75 percent of the population and my concern is what happens to that other 25 percent that's out in the the area and and so it, how do you get in how do you define that circle if you will that's in which you you score the 75 percent penetration that's a good, it's a good question i think um and and actually this goes to one of the proposals in the bill i think moving to wireline centers actually helps i think the the smaller you can make the study the circle, area, right. the less you're going to run into that problem. But remember, under our proposal, you still have the ability, if in fact there's some other area that isn't being covered, to make a showing that USF high cost support is still appropriate. Within that, so if you have an area that's 100% and 75% the the uh, area that is served would meet your test, do you have that ability under your proposal to go after that remaining 25% in that area and be subsidized to it? To yes. Reach it? yes, the incumbent can come make a showing that there's 25 percent that's not covered by competition and that there's still a need for high cost support. All right. My, my time's expired, but I appreciate your generosity with the time. And again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you very much, Mr. Walden. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for seven minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for our witnesses for being here. Uh, Mr. Baum, let me ask you this question, if I, I may. A uh, little different twist here. Uh, do you believe that as we reform USF that we should consider the telecommunication needs of public safety? And, and if so, how would you go about doing that? Well, you're aware that public safety is one of the uh, applications that's eligible under the broadband stimulus. On the stimulus, right. Yes, and there's also those 700 megahertz applications that some of the local jurisdictions are applying for waivers to get from the public safety trust. So that's moving ahead on that front. So there's kind of some things moving ahead, but right now, instance in Oregon we have a 440 million dollar bonded project to build out microwave um, public safety network right. and those are local state efforts so nationally there are some funding available through the uh, Department of Homeland Security there's some stimulus money there uh, it's obviously not going to do the trick but uh, we we judge our applications for stimulus based on how many of these proposals they serve whether they provide public safety application in their proposal telehealth distance learning 
All those things are part of the application process that we're encouraging companies to make in the, under the broadband stimulus to make sure they satisfy those criteria. Right, but what about under USF? Should we use law enforcement? I mean, especially when we talk about inter interoperability. I mean, rural areas just cannot keep up with the high cost of technology. In my perfect world, we would focus on those unserved areas and anchor institutions would include law enforcement, schools, libraries, medical facilities, and from there you could build it out and spider web it out to the residences, but you need to have that for the public safety network as Correct. well. Okay. Mr. Graham, you want to jump in on it? Yes, thank you. The easiest way to deploy broadband for public service, at least within the state of Mississippi, is to make broadband a supported service immediately. We are in the process of pre-planning some um, applications with the Mississippi Highway Patrol, which would allow officers to have an e-ticket program with a wireless connection. It would also allow them to input accident data into their laptop and their Sure, computer. but that's basically for state employees, right? That uh, how, how do you get your local, local police chiefs, the sheriff's departments in the same system so it's interoperable, so you do have a seamless flow of communication? Seems like that's we're going right. to have a dedication of fund that's somewhere between 20 and $40 billion, and every time we try to do a trust fund so law enforcement would have the money, it, we never seem to get anywhere. In our metro, one of our metro counties, we've already launched this with the sheriff's department, uh, a similar program. They've got broadband connectivity from their cars. Um, applications are easy to envision where they'll have real-time video on late at night on a county road, uh, and you can easily extend that into paramedics and emergency responders like that. Sure. The, the county may have it, but what about the municipalities within there? Are, are they part of that same system? They're not part of that same system yet. They could be part of that system. Could be, would be, want to be. Lack of money, as long right? as the services, as long as the, the cloud is there, the broadband cloud is there, they can access it. Let me ask you this, then, Mr. Graham. Based on your testimony, uh, since 2000, uh, USF has provided like $26 billion in subsidies, landline, and 4000 for wireless. The FCC capped the wireless uh, fund to control costs, but we still have an increased contribution rate, somewhere around, went from about 10% to 14%. So... We've increased the contribution that consumers are paying, yet we capped the wireless. Uh, seems like we're getting less for more. So Joel Barton, when he comes in with his telephone bill, he's paying more, but yet we have less uh, than, than we did two years later for, for wireless communication. Isn't that really the way we're going? We would completely agree with that. We've got, we're going in the wrong direction capping wireless. Um, wireless may have seen growth, but it's because we've gone from zero funding to the funding we receive today. Uh, we continue to subsidize 1876 technology at, at cost level. Whatever it costs them to build the network, they get the money. Okay. The, the draft bill contemplates capping USF support for high-cost areas. And in your testimony, you assert that the bill would allow certain high-cost carriers to receive support indefinitely. Uh, do we run the risk of freezing investment much like what has occurred with rural wireless? We do run that risk, and um, in some areas, curtail investment, and in other areas, if the cap continues to run indefinitely. Uh, what would you propose to change this in, in the we, current legislation? Well, we would target the support to areas where it's absolutely necessary. We think a thorough review by the expert agency must be undertaken. That has not been done. No one has ever sat down and figured out exactly where this support really and truly needs to go. Okay. Mr. Lubin, let me ask you, because in your testimony, you also urged a bit of caution about how we utilize a cap to contain costs. Uh, does AT&T believe a cap may run the risk of freezing investment in rural areas? Um, th yes, there is that risk. So same thing, identifying, mapping? Um, for, for us, the bottom line is, if you have that cap, you've potentially constrained how much investment in the high-cost areas, and, and that's a dilemma. That links back into a lot of the different things we've discussed this morning. Okay. Uh, Mr. McSlero, let me ask you this one. I'm looking at your map here that you submitted. This is your how, – how, how did you identify these areas uh, to access high-cost support funding, and, and, and what was the data for your economic analysis on this to come up the, with this map? The um – the data that we use is the, is the data that's produced by the rural study areas within the high cost program itself. So what we essentially did is we took all of the rural study areas and looked at the support that was going to each of them. Then we overlaid that on top of what we knew about where unsubsidized competition was. 
All right. So so it's you get that 75 percent area, then you get the uncompensated competition or unregulated. Yeah, and I should just point out in, in our proposal, we, we took we actually made what we believe is the most conservative case. We're not even taking into account wireless. We're just saying if there's another unsubsidized wireline competitor, that uh, that's the case for taking a fresh look. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, it's my understanding uh, you're concerned with broadband network connections being assessed for contribution into the USF. How would you propose to ensure that contribution mechanisms are there long term? Uh, again, we capped off wireless, and, but yet we've spending more. It's received more money. How do we do it long term so we're not seeing problems? Pardon? In terms of the contribution yes. side, um, well, our, like a lot of folks, we, we're, we support a numbers approach, but but that's just a proxy for saying a connection. Correct. Our concern about broadband revenues is simply this. All the other services are highly penetrated. They're at the 90-plus level. Broadband, as we've all been talking about, still has some adoption challenges. So we're a little leery putting another assessment or fee on the cost of broadband when we're actually over here trying to drive more adoption. But a numbers approach or some kind of connectivity approach that's, that's true for everybody across the board, we think that's the way to go. And that does broaden the base. If you use numbers approach, aren't you still with the rural areas with small population base still never being built out that broadband? If you, I mean, you look at your map, I mean, heck, my district's not even covered hardly. If you take phone numbers, I think there are about 650 million phone numbers in existence. If you had something that's something less than a dollar a month, you, you right there you get your seven, over $7 billion for the entire Universal Service Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Stupak. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Booyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. McSlero, I wanted to um, give you an opportunity to clarify. And when you were answering questions, Mr. Barton, um, relative to the expansion, um, I got this sense, did you really mean that we should be taxing broadband by implication here? I just want you to clarify what you meant by Yes, more people should be paying in. Well, I may have misunderstood his question because, as I just as I just said to Mr. Stupak, we're against taxing broadband. I thought what he asked was wh whether or not we are for broadening the base, and we are through okay. a, a numbers assessment. All right. So thank you. If that's if I misunderstood that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. The uh, the cap on the high cost fund in the voucher Terry bill. Uh, due to exceptions, is being referred to as a soft cap. Uh, if we don't put a firm cap on the high-cost fund, what would be the impact on consumers? Well, as I said in my testimony, uh, you know, with the contribution factor going to be reaching 14 percent next year and no end in sight unless we fix the system, I think everyone agrees that th there, there needs to be some kind of cap on the process here or it will simply become unsustainable. So what does unsustainable mean? Unsustainable means that people like Mr. Barton and other folks who are looking at the bottom of their telephone bill are going to say, I'm not going to pay 25 percent of my, of my bill to subsidize this system anymore. So it has to be fixed. I think what, uh, what Representatives Boucher and Terry have done have, have introduced a cap concept, uh, and, and as you hear throughout this panel, there are a lot of different positions on how exactly to do that. I would just urge this committee and all of those that are going to be participating in the legislative process to preserve uh, the discipline, um, as much discipline as possible in keeping that cap as concrete as it can be as it moves through the process because that's what's going to keep the system sustainable going in, into the future. So I think there's been a, an honest attempt to create a cap uh, and talking with the various parties, um, they've, they've reached the cap they have. I just urge everyone to, to keep, it, keep it as tight as possible. In response to Ms. Blackburn, Mr. Davidson, you uh, said you're an advocate for a universal service fees to be based on a numbers-based system versus revenue. Uh, and you, that's correct? Yes. All right. I'd like to get a sense and go right down the line of whom would advocate a numbers-based system versus a revenue-based system. So, Mr. Greer? We would in, in, um, advocate a revenues-based system. A revenue-based. Connections-based. Connections based? Connections numbers, yes. Numbers, all right. Telephone numbers. Connections. 
NARIC doesn't have a position, but I would support numbers and connections. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Telephone numbers. RCA doesn't have a position on that yet, but some hybrid numbers and contributions based. ATA doesn't have a position on that. Okay. Uh, I haven't studied it much, but it seems to me that numbers or connections would be a better way than revenues. And it's, uh, if we go to numbers, it's better with predictability. Would you not agree? Mr. Rostin, since the, uh, the, the goal of the high-cost fund is to make service more affordable for consumers in high-cost areas, shouldn't the focus be on consumers and not necessarily the carriers? Meaning, shouldn't the subsidy follow the consumer so that if the carrier loses a subscriber, they also lose the subsidy? Absolutely. Very good. I yield back. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, those questions. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your work here. Uh, I want to ask Commissioner Baum if I could. The discussion draft allows eligible providers uh, basically to avoid the requirement of offering broadband service where it's deemed too costly uh, for them to do that. And I gather that's about three times the national average. Uh, do you see this uh, as a clause, almost an escape clause, that could let providers that still receive support not make significant expansions where they're needed? I'm not sure about the impact of that 2.75 uh, ratio. Um, First of all, before I say that, I want to thank you for speaking at NARIC yesterday. We appreciate you coming out. Now back to your question. Um, you. At some point, we have to have some way by which we're going to determine how far we're going to penetrate into those high-cost rural areas, and particularly unserved portions. And I'm not sure if that 2.75 ratio is accurate. We may be able to go further than that, but at some point, we're probably not going to be able to afford to provide high-speed broadband to every person or residence in America, regardless of where they're located. But what I'm, it would, I'm kind of wondering if we have it structured right, because obviously there may be a point where the cost is beyond what is affordable. But on the other hand, there's a lot of rural areas where uh, we need that, that service, Vermont among them. And uh, the specific question I have is whether you're going to have, under the draft language, some possibility of companies on the one hand receiving support, uh, but on the other hand uh, actually not doing build-out in some of these areas. I just can't tell you based on the, f I, I wasn't briefed on how that actually worked or why was I part of that process, but there's got to be some way by which we can figure out how far we're going to go and the percentage should be in the high 90s, and I'm just not sure between 95 and 100 percent how far we can go on an affordability basis. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rostam, how about you? I know you've studied the economics of this uh, pretty extensively. So uh, my view is if you, if you went to a system of vouchers to consumers, you would not have to worry about this because they'd be cost-based and you would get uh, them able to pay in other areas. I think it's important to also consider the satellite alternatives right. in very, very high-cost areas. And what's, what is the cost of a satellite connection? Uh, my, my impression, I haven't subscribed, but I thought it was somewhere between $70 and $90 a month for broadband access. Okay. So, and that would be, in contrast, if there was the build-out, what would be the, the average cost there? Well, if you, if you think that sort of people pay in the 40 to $50 range in urban areas and you're talking three times that for this bill, that would be uh, getting it well more than the 70 to 90 for a retail subscription to satellite. All right. Thank you. Mr. McSlara, how about you, your view on this? I mean, I'm interested in, in obviously a rural uh, build-out uh, representing uh, a rural state. Uh, and the point has been made uh, by you as well as by folks on this table that that build-out is really a lifeline. Uh, for the economic activity of those uh, rural residents, and they're there for a variety of reasons. I, d I don't think it's quite uh, an individual choice to uh, to be a hermit. <laughs> uh, there are those of us who, you know, I, live, I come from a town of 1,800 people. That's my base, <laughs> and we like broadband. Go ahead, Mr. McSlarrow. Right. No, I think um, our, our view is that there clearly are areas that deserve high-cost targeted support, um, and it's about taking scarce dollars and putting them where they're needed. I will say that at least in, in, in our own is industry's experience, whether it's broadband or phone, we don't actually differentiate in terms of the pricing in an urban area to a rural area. So if we're there. You do not. Right. Not. Right. And you support maintaining that non-discrimination in pricing. 
we tend to just roll out across our entire national footprints. Okay, thank you. Congressman, um, could, I, yeah. could I expand on that just sure. for a second? Sure, Mr. Um, Davidson, go ahead. I think uh, one of the things to recognize as well is that, that uh, the expense in the areas that you represent aren't necessarily last mile expenses as well. We have a proposal um, that deals with what's so-called middle mile, uh, which is terms of the amount of transport that broadband needs to go over long areas to get to remote areas and then mm -hmm. serve those remote areas. So um, I would be happy to, to explain and come talk to you a little bit more about what our proposal is. But basically, we think that if you provide some support to build those middle mile facilities right. and, then the, the, and then that subsidy goes to the end broadband provider, it doesn't go to the middle mile facility, but it makes it uh, possible for that middle mile provider to build, build the transport, um, that's enough of an incentive perhaps to, to tip the balances in terms of bringing broadband to more remote areas. So we'd encourage you to look at that proposal right. as well. well. I look forward to seeing that. By the way, while you're here, uh, Verizon, uh, I know, is, is it's left or you're in the process of leaving 17 rural states with your uh, wireline network. Uh, Vermont, of course, is one where you did recently leave. Uh, and what I understand is you're also going to not discontinue providing what is relatively high-cost support for the wireless network. Uh, I'm wondering whether Verizon is willing to commit to serve every customer and be the carrier of last resort. Uh, throughout all of your rural areas uh, without any universal service support? Well, uh, f first of all, let me, let me um, I wanted to respond to this question earlier uh, that came up as well. Commissioner Baum had mentioned um, the development of this, uh, of the new rural LEC company, and we have Windstream here, uh, we have CenturyLink, we have um, others that do an excellent job with the business model in terms of serving rural areas. So issues like the parent trap and others are very important and, and kind of get to your question as well. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the Verizon territories, um, you know, we, we, we currently uh, participate in the universal service program in certain, in certain areas. We're by far a payor into the system uh, by, by a large amount. Um, and we take a small amount out, and that amount is just decreasing over time due to merger conditions and other, th other reasons. So we, we actually participate on the payee side to a very small percent right now. Okay. So, but again, we, we support the bill, and we support moving through the, the process in terms of serving our existing All right, customers. Let me we, stop you there. I only have, thank you for that. Okay. I only have a few seconds left. Mr. Lubin, uh, in reviewing the draft legislation, what would you uh, uh, see as the three most important components of it? The three most important components of this, contribution reform, fixing it, intercarrier comp, fixing it, and recognizing USF for uh, broadband. The 21st century is all about broadband. POTS is going away. You've got to figure out how to get broadband. I'm sympathetic to your point of how do you get into the rural area. Mr. Lubin, speak for the rest of you. General consensus, Ms. Uh, Commissioner we, Baum. Well, just, just one question. I've now figured out your first question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but yes, there would be a great if that that three factor that they have in there yeah. would effectively take communities in some areas of Oregon that are under like 500 population in under who are remote wouldn't be a, wouldn't be serviced by by this uh, broadband effort. Okay, thank you. I think Mr. Graham wants to speak, but I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman, so I'll yield back. Graham, go ahead. Very briefly, um, one other piece of uh, discussion draft would be true competitive neutrality when wireless goes into an area, we don't get support until we get a customer. When we lose a customer, we lose that support. It seems incredibly reasonable for us, for everyone to get support when they get customers and lose support when they lose customers. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Welsh. And the committee's thanks to all of our witnesses today. We've had a thorough ranging and informative conversation about universal service. I appreciate the broad consensus of support for the discussion draft that's been expressed by the witnesses here today and the many recommendations that we've received for possible um, additional changes that we could make which would expand that consensus even further. We intend to focus on those recommendations and have con uh, subsequent conversations with many of you as, as we do so over the coming weeks. And our goal will be to fashion a reform that with broad bipartisan support we can pass through this committee in the House and have it acted into law during the course of this Congress. Each of you here has contributed to that process today, and we thank you for it, and uh, this hearing stands adjourned.